And we are live. This is Dark Journalist. Oh, what a fantastic crowd we have out there in the ideas from already tonight. Of course, tonight I am joined by the lovely Olivia. Hi, everybody. And uh, Olivia, there's a star man waiting in the sky. Mm -hmm. He'd like to come and meet us, but he thinks he'd blow our minds. Or is he in Miami? (laughs) That is the question. I have a lot of uh, the Miami news reports of this incredible uh, raid, as it were. Police presence, black helicopters, mobilization. It's quite a scene. You don't do that for angry teenagers. Mm -hmm. Something is definitely amiss there. And Flights were canceled. All kinds of outrageous outages. Um, it's going to be a spooky year. I, I think we can see that yeah. already. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. I've also, um, you know, taken it upon myself through people's messages and emails to look into it a little bit. And whatever that official story is, it does not hold. So we're looking at something where they're not quite telling us what's going on. And then there's this other thing about uh, reports that through the mall, these uh, kind of large scale, eight foot tall beings were walking around the mall. And that's what called out the National Guard and all the cops and everything. Um, it's hard to say. It's really hard to say. But I'll tell you um, something. There's something weird about what took place down there. The and weirdest it, thing is that all of us can, <laughs> we can actually wrap our heads around the idea that that might be true. Eight <laughs> to 10 foot aliens in a mall in Miami. Oh, well, there was that weird story. You remember when all the Grush hearing stuff was going on last summer? And uh, this is interesting because this story came kind of wild. It was just before the uh, Grush had just come out, but it was just before the hearings. And, um, you know, and the, and the Grush thing, we've already kind of talked on this a little bit. Uh, this, there's a lot of weirdness there in that story. But in any case, right before it hit, there was this thing about a crashed UFO in the back of somebody's house in Las Vegas. And, you know, they were like, oh, look, you know, we have all these cell phone pictures of it and (laughs) the smartphone stuff. I don't know. I mean, there is something odd about the environment that we're in. And that might be why we're seeing so many strange things in relation to this, but it plays right into what we're talking about tonight, which is our first X series show of 2024. So it's really great to be here with everyone. And this one is X series 163. It is the Valerie UFO file. And the Valerie involved is Valerie Jean Lyra Ransone. And um, Valerie is a very interesting character who shows up on the radar right along the lines of uh, Gordon Cooper. She's working in the White House at a very young age. She's working on things like breakthrough energy. And um, she is getting messages from ETs. I kid you not. And she starts this advanced technology group, which is actually called to the people who are working in it, the psychic uh technology group. And this is very interesting because she's bringing in this concept immediately. So we're going to look at this whole interface of psychic energy with the UFO file through the figure of Valerie Ransone tonight and her very, very conspicuous partner in crime, Gordon Cooper, uh, who knew a great deal uh, through NASA and the spacewalks and all the things that he did, but also that he was the inside astronaut for President Kennedy. And in fact, we're going to reveal tonight that he was going to be in the motorcade, but he had called away at the last minute uh, by Mm. name in that motorcade. Very interesting indeed. Not sus Um, at all. (laughs) Exactly. We have so many things um, to cover here tonight. Before we go any further, I want to remind you to go to darkjournalist.com, especially if you're new here, and sign up for our newsletter. That's a free newsletter but it keeps us in touch and with all the censorship that we're living through uh, on our end, you have to have that direct pipeline. And, um, you know, we'll basically let you know once or twice a week, what's going on, what shows are happening. We have some incredible (laughs) shows, episodes, amazing interviews set up for 2024 live events, documentaries. You're not going to want to miss it. Save the date, February 25th, uh, by the way, and I'll come back to this at the end of the show. That's a very, very, you're going to want to be available for that one. Um, But go to darkjournalist.com and sign up for the newsletter. Before I go any further tonight, Miss Olivia, you're up. (laughs) Renee Cruz says, 
uh, where there's where there's mall cameras inside, I want to see the extraterrestrial alien carnage in the food court. <laughs> That's true. Everything has the camera deal now. And uh, of course, all the police showing up have their cams as well. But that stuff is just as easy uh, to manipulate in the grand scheme of things. So, you know, we have to be careful because, yeah, it's one degree <laughs> of uh, transparency. And then, you know, there's this other layer thing. They have programs for when they need to cover something up. Um, that involves national security, as it were. Um, you might notice a very interesting car model back here, and that is the Starsky and Hutch Gran Torino. Zebra 3. David Soul passed away today. Hutch on Starsky and Hutch. And um, anyone who knows me knows I'm a completely ravenous <laughs> <laughs> for... Um, the 70s television cop shows, which I just think were fantastically written and, and directed. And my retro thing, you know, I, I go back to a lot of things. I, I guess I actually shoot all the way back to the 50s and 40s with that, but the 70s in particular, some of those shows are just so great. And that's the best of the best. <laughs> I think Starsky and Hutch. This, of course, was the car. And um, it, it was it was so kind of iconic. and. No kidding, one time in Harvard Square, quite a few years ago now, I was in Harvard Square with Miss Olivia and we saw an exact model of the Starsky and Hutch We followed it. By. Do you remember that? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> this was incredible. Um, but David Soul always had that very, very deep quality to him that seemed to transcend television. And uh, in fact, he... He came out of uh, cinema because he was in Magnum Force with mm -hmm. Clint Eastwood and uh, he was instantly a cinematic guy, but he got this great role on Starsky and Hutch. But he was in the movies again with Salem's Lot. And mm -hmm. uh, as we all know, that was a fantastic classic about a vampire there in Salem. Um, but what I would say is that on the acting scale, the guy was fantastic. And uh, he seemed to have a great sense of humor also. Mm -hmm. So uh, we miss you, Hutch. <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting, too, because when you start a year... Um, you know, this is a very interesting thing. When I look out at 2024, the election is the thing that I've identified. Many of the things that were you know, are about to happen in 2024 were laid out very carefully in 2023. And this is the thing, the election aspect, the UFO file aspect, many of the revelations going on, the way that things are handled and how they're kind of throwing the ball here and there to characters like Musk and, you know, they're coming on like free speech heroes and things like that. Well, they have to maintain the facade and that's so much the better for us <laughs> as it were. But um, what I would like to see a lot more of is a very kind of adult conversation when it comes to a lot of these uh, kind of more mysterious aspects that we tackle on the X series. And what you're seeing in the general run is people just throwing all kinds of stuff out there all the time. And um, so you're seeing, you know, a lot of this craziness. And it's interesting because the story that hit as we got into 2024 was the Epstein uh, story. And mm -hmm. there's so much to bring out there. One of the things, um, and I'm going to mention this episode that I think is crucial and opens up a whole different discussion around Epstein. I think the independent media got to the Epstein conversation first, way before the mainstream and did some good things with it. Although uh, there is this tendency to um, just harp on the things that are the most obvious. And uh, you want to go really deep when you're involved in situations like that. And what we did with uh, a series around Ghislaine Maxwell, with Ghislaine in the hot zone, as it were, was study the connections of Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein to um, the Atlantis uh, aspect in the hot zone and the Belial cult that surges around it and explains a great deal of their activities beyond just the political uh, blackmail aspects, which are certainly there. So that episode is called The Colonel in the Hot Zone, and it brings in the testimony of Virginia Jufre, which people are pouring through. And it is funny because a lot of this reminds me very much of how the JFK records rollout goes because a lot of people think they're getting everything. Hey, <laughs> and then it turns out you're like, oh, wait a minute, this was released in 2012, you know? And, um, you know, you have people studying things like they're brand new and, and they're not, you know, they've been out for five years or whatever. So, um, 
you know, very careful sifting and not going for the crazy headlines on it, but getting the real deep stuff, the deep connecting dots. I think on this is important. The Atlantis part cannot be missed because on the record we have Ghislaine Maxwell using Janet Atlantis. This is her pseudonym when she buys her house. And um, this for me is um, the crucial aspect going all the way back to her father, Robert, and the, the idea that, um, you know, Bill Barr's dad is the one who got Epstein to start, and he's writing science fiction books about advanced races on the moon and, you know, their advanced genetics, all this kind of stuff. You have to know those threads in order to get through, because otherwise the mainstream and the independent media are going to keep you on the salacious trail. And it is, you know, there's no doubt it's true, but there's there's something else going on in this case, and that involves the scientific aspect. It's there in the Colonel in the Hot Zone episode. Later this month, we're going to have an episode that brings around all of the uh, deeper aspects of that case with the Atlantis Hot Zone proposition coming at you straight and as potent as possible right there. Everyone you're here uh, with us for Dark Journalist X Series 163, the Valerie UFO file, Gordon Cooper, Nikola Tesla, mm -hmm. remote viewing, and NASA. They're all deeply involved here, as is an entire group that is not talked about anywhere in any of the circles around independent media, certainly not mainstream, about a psychic technology group. Um, how do we get how do we get into that? And how does it relate to some of the figures that we're familiar with? Um, this is how we're going to get in tonight. I have a couple of things I wanted to um, jump into around election 2024 before we go any further. Miss Olivia, what do you got? Uh, Jessica Rodriguez says, what a great way to start the new year with a brand new show from Dark Journalist. <laughs> uh, I'm excited. We had a fantastic run of interviews to get us through the holiday season. And then this kind of sleeper episode with John Warner, which we've just kind of, you know, we knew that it had some powerful pieces in it, but uh, people just loved that last episode uh, with Warner and Warner let out something very important about his grandfather, Paul Mellon. And this is the great thing about what we have with John Warner. The fourth has been on the show many times. He's an author and a uh, former race card driver and he is also the son of Catherine Mellon and Senator John Warner, the late Senator of Virginia. Um, his stepmom was Elizabeth Taylor, as we know. Mm -hmm. This guy's a very interesting life, but um, he has a great grasp on uh, where the UFO file is in terms of the whole disclosure narrative and how many of the players, the way they're doing it, because he has a lot of inside political knowledge along with the fact that his cousin, Chris Mellon, is running you know, the UFO threat aspect of this for the intelligence agencies. And so you know, the, the clash in the public sphere of those two people from entirely different <laughs> outlooks, I think is very important. But one of the things he put on the record about uh, his grandfather, Paul Mellon, was that when Paul Mellon was in Germany, um, and this is, you know, they're picking up the pieces after the war, that he goes into one of these underground bunkers and he sees a craft, a saucer like craft that is over a football field in diameter. And it's very interesting because a lot of the cases that I had been studying for this episode involved these very large UFOs. And um, the fact that we have an eyewitness account in private to um, his grandson from Paul Mellon to John, I think is absolutely crucial. And, you know, I put this on the record before that when someone claims something publicly, that's a little bit different. When you have, it reminds me of the Douglas Caddy situation with E. Howard Hunt. And E. Howard Hunt was someone who was very close to Caddy. They were friends. Before he goes to prison, he tells them, about JFK being assassinated over the UFO file. This is not something he put out as a book or a headline or anything like that. It was a little confession between friends, and in this case, a grandfather and a grandson with Mellon. And um, I think that this is very important because the, there's, there's a major difference about what happens there in private. And those are the types of things that we need 
for these people to come forward with. And so John did us a favor there, but that episode just went <laughs> off the charts and uh, I was very happy to get that one out there. It's going to help us because of the football field sized uh, craft. And there were a few of you from the ideas room who sent me emails about seeing something like that at one point. And, you know, some of these sightings were from 25 years ago and I'm not even saying that they were German craft or alien or anything, but nonetheless, the sightings themselves are very fascinating. And we, we get into them tonight. Um, as a matter of fact, the subject matter is so sprawling tonight that you can see it's already going to go into two episodes for sure. And what's interesting is this is a follow on from an episode that we did called uh, Cooper in the hot zone from December. And that episode was an expanded edition of an episode that we <laughs> did a year ago, which got pulled down with no real explanation. Mm. You know, it was like, dangerous rhetoric or something. <laughs> I, you know, yeah. Talking about NASA and the moon is dangerous, I guess. Um, so that's where we go from there. Uh, we do have a section tonight also on the sleeping prophet, Edgar Casey, and what he had to say about the period that we're in Arcturus and also a lot of the Japan uh, earthquake activity and how it fit into some of the earth changes he talked about. So a power packed episode, uh, we'll take one question before we start off. Uh, and then we'll get rolling right into tonight. Uh, it's not a question, but Mary said, I think there are some motherships out there that will boggle the mind. Well, um, I've got my own grand, well, it's not grandfather, it's grandmother's story about seeing a large, it was at four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, a large cigar shaped uh, craft. And um, where was this? This was in Brookline, Mass. And, um, you know, I think she was in her 20s. I'm trying to think of when this would be. Probably the 1950s, somewhere mm -hmm. like that. And for me, um, you know, her description of it, she wasn't somebody who wanted to talk about UFOs, but she had this massive sighting, this thing just kind of lumbering through the neighborhood. And that cigar shape is very interesting to me in terms of the craft. Those tend to be the larger ones that are reported. And if you go into the Casey readings, in fact, um, Casey has a flash forward of himself being reincarnated in 2100 in Nebraska. And um, it, Nebraska is on the coast <laughs> in this. And uh, the family's name is a strange one. And he realizes when he's young that he's reincarnated and he knows where to go to get the, the Casey records. And the scientists show up to study him, and uh, they are in these cigar-shaped flying objects. Now, the dream is from the 1930s. Wait a second. Do they come to study him because they know that he was Edgar Casey in a past they life? They do. Oh, wow. And not only that, but they take him around the countryside, and everything that he looks down on, on the houses, they're all glass. They're all mm. made of glass. That's pretty interesting. The other thing that's interesting in that visionary state that he was in is when he goes past New York, it's all destroyed and it's being rebuilt either because of earthquake or because of war, but it's completely demolished. And it's very easy to imagine that now. <laughs> Let's face it. Um, but so therefore, when we get around those types of craft, I think you're dealing with something very, very anomalous. And, uh, you know, when you get into other things that are more traditional uh, shapes for UFOs, uh, I, a lot of those are probably things that we're making, it's my opinion. But uh, some of these big ones, you really have to wonder in terms of monitors coming into the solar system. I just wanted to share this. Yeah. Thomas Ball says, you settle into an episode of Dark Journalist like a warm bath. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll try to keep the bubbles going here. Um, uh, yeah, so we talked about this already. So, you know, it's hitting everywhere about that Miami alien. So we, um, you know, we see that the media is on it. And there's a weird thing with the media now. What they want is, I think they realized deep in the Bilderberg <laughs> basement meeting, you know, when they told Jack Smith that there were, he, just, he wasn't going to get any more ice baths unless he put uh, Trump in prison. Um, when they were looking around at the subject matter, they said, well, th one of the things that the independent media is beating us on, really whipping us on, is this UFO aspect. We have our own version of the UFO threat thing. Why don't we just roll that out? 
we'll admit to, you know, the UFO thing, but we'll make it our version and they'll never know the truth about it. So what's the difference? And then we get all the traffic, we get all the site traffic, we get all this other stuff. That explains the entire media, media strategy around this going from really, really denying everything and blowing it off and making it a joke or entertainment, you know, men in black movies, which I still haven't seen. Uh, <laughs> everyone is shocked at that, but I have no desire to, to see them. Um, but for me, that whole entertainment layer is another, was another kind of subterfuge to keep it at this level. Um, I think there were earlier attempts like close encounters to condition the culture, to embrace the whole UFO file aspect. That's different. And I think that those may have been much more positive uh, moves, kind of more X share versus X protect style moves. But in any case, uh, the thing is off the rails now and it's being, it, you know, the asylum is being run by the lunatics on the UFO uh, front. And all the things that we're seeing is a huge um, intelligence classified briefing next week going on. And um, the net result of that on our level is going to be nothing, but there's going to continue to beat the drums inside to build up that UFO defense office. Very dangerous situation because the thing that they need, uh, regardless of all the other things that are going on in the world, they need an emergency because they need emergency powers because it's becoming very clear that they cannot reign from traditional democratic purchase, um, you know, elections and things of this nature. So the popularity is way, way down. What do you do? Well, the only thing you can do is seize power through emergency powers. And that's the continuity of government uh, program being activated through some kind of UFO emergency. We saw a trial run for that last February. We did a lot of reporting on it. People weren't sure what to make of it, but the fact that the NORAD commander was out there uh, to me was a, a real highlight of 2023. Here's the interesting thing. At the end of the year, it came out that the Biden administration tried to hide the Chinese balloon from the public dramatically. That was their first reaction. And also that the balloon was using an, a U.S.-based internet system to send information back to China. This is highly irregular. And uh, the people I've talked to behind the scenes around this are confused as to what was going on uh, and the whole thing about the headlines about UFO shoot down, et cetera. I expect that to be right in the heart. Uh, you know, I'm not going to do predictions. <laughs> Don't worry about that. But I expect that to be right in the heart of uh, what we're doing in 2024. This is, and I, I warned the Trump campaign and I warned the RFK campaign, get in on the UFO file thing. They're already running down the ball field with it. And both of these guys are in the know on the subject and you should not leave it on the cutting room floor. Um, the other piece of advice that I want to give to the campaigns like uh, Bobby's campaign and Trump's campaign, you know, Trump's campaign has been doing well because it's benefiting from all the failures of the, um, the Biden debacle. And just the fact that everybody knows that this guy can't run the country and there's a border invasion. Um, but he still needs, in order to win the hearts and minds of people, it's not going to be a cakewalk, regardless of how bad Biden is. They might switch him out. They might do all kinds of things. Um, but he still needs that plan, that like five-point plan. Here's how I save America. And yeah, he mentions different aspects of it in speeches, but there's, there's a lot of bellicose stuff in those speeches, but people want to walk away with a plan like, oh, look, I have the Trump plan. This is it. It's the five points, how he's going to save the country. He is going to, you know, introduce a tax cut. He is going to shore up the border with the National Guard. He is, you know, it's the points and these specifics. And um, so Trump needs to do that. It, he, it could be a runaway election in many ways if he were able to pull that off. Uh, in terms of Bobby, there's a real problem with this campaign and I always separate the candidate who I think is great from the campaign and um, you know I think the campaign is very adrift and uh, they need to get on all 50 ballots immediately they're on one right now and um, you know I, they're just not they're not coming off with a serious tone they keep touting the fact that um, you know, they're doing well with 18 to 24 year olds that's great you know but you can't win 
with 18 to 24 year olds, you actually have to, the people that you do the worst with are the ones that you need to win over the baby boomers aspect. And um, you, you can't, I don't know who's running that campaign if they think, hey, you know, we'll win it with the kids. It's great. You know, it reminds me of the Barry Goldwater campaign of 1964, where Barry Goldwater got trounced and he only won 40% of the vote. But that became the foundation in 64 of a campaign 16 years later, Ronald Reagan, which, you know, they had Reagan as a speaker in the 64 campaign and all those conservative principles, you know, their time had come. Um, so that if you want to run a campaign like that, great. If you want to win this one, then the 18 to 24 year old vote is like, you know, 5% of the electorate. So that's not going to do anything. I don't know who is spinning these things inside that campaign. The other thing, the, the major super PAC around the Bobby campaign said that they could win with 15 delegates. No, you can't win with 15 delegates. You win with 270. And I double checked this to make sure they made the statement. And I think the idea this, what that was suggested was that Biden and Trump wouldn't be able to make it to 270. So it would throw it into the Congress. Well, the only thing the Congress would do is award it to Trump or Biden or whoever that Democratic candidate is. They'd never give it to an independent. So whoever is feeding these things out in that campaign, it needs to be rooted out. And if I were Bobby, I would start the campaign of 2024 by throwing out the campaign team and starting with a new team now. Because <laughs> you have 11 months to work with. You can do it. You can make it happen. Something is wrong with the messaging in that campaign. And, uh, you know, the stuff that they, they just put out a heavy metal ad. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, there's something there's something wrong. And um, I would like to see the five point plan from Bobby about how he's going to save America and he needs to take the gloves off in relation to the Biden campaign. Um, you know, Stepford Biden, the president, is destroying the country by, um, you know, letting this incredible influx invasion at the southern border and, uh, you know, the destruction of the economy all this division, the division in the social policy, um, all the things that they are doing, the wars and, um, you know, the incredible disaster of this administration. And once in a while, Bobby says something like, you know, we don't have a common sense <laughs> policy at the border. You know, you need to, you know, the, I suggested, I was thinking about who would win this campaign of 2024 and who I came up with, Miss Olivia, mm -hmm. John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist could win this campaign. That's what you need. The guy who's going to go out there with the passion and really bring the other side to the wall and say, these are the things you cannot destroy this country. You're in the process of destroying this country. I'm going to stop you. That's who's going to win. Actually, I love the Michael York version of John the Baptist. <laughs> I forget what which What is that movie. from? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was that um, Jesus of Nazareth, the yeah. series? It's the best. Yeah. You know, that screaming it, in the sure. pit. You know, this is what we need. A lot. Of, we need passion. I think so. You're not going to win it with cutesiness and Joe Rogan interviews. Hey, you everybody know. can see through all this marketing now, right? We're all cynical. <laughs> yeah. We've wised up. It's not going to work. Yeah, Just, I'd say you know, throw that throw that stuff in too. Give us the truth. It's fine, but you know, do me a favor and give me the five point plan. How are you going to save America? Otherwise, it's, it's a waste of everyone's time and money. Now, it can be the greatest thing in the world, and you can bring Camelot back. But this ain't it. So you're going to have to do it. And, you know, you're the responsible officer of the campaign at the end of the day. So the RFK Jr. campaign has a great candidate and a completely diluted campaign. And the Trump campaign is doing well because the other side, uh, on, on the Biden side, they're doing so poorly. But he's, he also needs a plan out there to say, I'm Trump. Here's what I'm good at. I'm good at the economy. Don't worry. I'm going to save America. You know, that's what Trump needs the plan out there. And what's weird is that Biden, who has a terrible record, but they are touting economics, which is smart because that's what everyone's going to be thinking of as we get into 2024. Those guys have the worst economic record in history, but the two candidates, uh, Trump and Bobby, are letting them get away with that bit by not mentioning anything about the economy, not coming out with their own plans. So there's my free advice to both campaigns to mm -hmm. bring America back together. Remember, RFK Jr. coming in from this side, Trump from that side, they can smash the Biden regime right down the middle. Can I and make that's one more comment on that? Yeah. You know, the, they always cite Clinton as being a genius about, you know, I feel your pain. And the thing is, they have to focus on 
individual Americans. It's one thing with soaring, yes. like Obama-like rhetoric, you know, about America. But actually, <laughs> I want to know that the candidate, you know, cares about me as an American, as an individual, you know, my family, my future. You know, I want to they should be invested oh, in me, an American citizen. Yeah. And nobody seems to be coming across like that. Nobody. Um, you know, Trump has one good line, which is, you know, they're after me because I'm protecting you. Mm -hmm. That's that's kind of the, the mindset. Um, but yeah, I think at, at a certain point, there are certain things like the Bobby campaign needs to stop with the 12-step type ads, you know, that kind of thing. I think we know enough about the candidate. What we want to know is what's your plan? What are you going to do for me? <laughs> Exactly. That's what I want to know. I like it. I like it. what have you done for me lately? <laughs> uh, everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. This is X Series 163. By the way, I'm I'm very much in favor of the things that Bobby is an incredibly brave speaker. It's his campaign uh, failures that I'm mentioning here, not the candidate. And I think that's an important separation. This is what Espensky had to do with Gurdjieff at a certain point. He was like, you know what? The teaching is fantastic. The guy, I can't take him anymore. You know. But in this case, I'm saying the guy's great, but the campaign is not is not working for me. And it, that's not a winning campaign. It can be, though, and he can bring the thunder. So let's see what happens. Um, you're watching X-Series 163, the Valerie UFO file. Are we going to get into it? We're going to get let's into it. Let's get into it. it. Um, and before we go any further, however, I want to mention that if you're new uh, out there in the ideas from especially go to darkjournalist.com and sign up for a newsletter for 2024. That's a free newsletter, but it keeps us in touch. It's going to let you know about the incredible things that we have coming up for you. Interviews, X series episodes. It's going to blow your mind. Uh, events and documentaries save the date, February 25th for an incredible broadcast that's coming up and uh, things for 2024 that you're not going to believe it's all in that newsletter, and it's all free right there for you. Uh, before I go any further, Miss Olivia, you're up. You know, Mad Dog said something really interesting. <laughs> if you want to see all the creatures around you, say this, quote, I break the code of disillusion. I wish to see what is before me. In a couple of weeks, it started for me, never saw anything serpent-like. Uh, I wonder what Mad Dog actually saw. But And that's kind of a scary idea to really how much do we want to break the code of disillusion i'm not sure i want to see what <laughs> we're going to have people walking around in robes in their house going, sham for us, sham. uh you know for me um it's pretty interesting you know there was an incredible revival in the 60s and 70s of esoteric groups and then on the other side there was all this black magic stuff that was coming in and uh, however even with all that wildness that was going on, I still think we were a lot closer to the truth of things with it's up to the individual and how they interact with the great cosmos energy of the universe thing rather than, oh, you know, it's it's me and I have a AI, you know, AI heart. <laughs> uh, I don't have a rock and roll heart. I have an AI heart. That whole trip for me, is less about the human experience and more assembly line aspect. You can find it in the movie, uh, Fritz Lang's movie, Metropolis, which is really the first AI movie. And um, I you confess know, I've never seen that. Oh, yeah. Oh, you would love it. I'm sure you would. I would. Love it. Um, but for me, it you know, that movie captures it. And it was made in 1928 by the same guy, as we put on the record last month, who did Women in the Moon. Mm. And Women in the Moon picked up that. by the mm -hmm. Nazi scientists for all the V2 rockets. So it's a heck of a lot going on there in early uh, German Expressionism film. And um, coming up in a Mars episode in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have something very, very interesting about that. But tonight's very, very interesting piece is going to blow your mind because there was a group that was operational in the 70s and 80s and then become very hard to track after about the mid-90s that were working very closely with the psychic aspects of advanced technology and that interface with the UFO file. You won't hear very much about them, and a lot of their activities got missed. There's only a couple of connecting points, and one of those points is a figure named Valerie Ransone. And um, she is very significant for being in these very elite circles and being identified at a very young age 
finishing high school early, finishing college early, and being recruited by originally the Nixon White House, then into the Ford White House, some very high level for some high level office activity around programs and operating directly out of the White House. Um, so this is someone who shows up on the radar as a result of Gordon Cooper really going back and rehashing everything that happened with her in his biography. But there were other stories and other threads about her out there as well, and we're going to get into those right now. Uh, I'd love to say that we have all these fantastic images of Valerie through the years, but in fact, it's very, very difficult to get anything. Um, I've been able to get some hardcore kind of, um, you know, just these little shots along the way. And then what seems like almost a composite personality where you have this person, Valerie, who has a real background, interfaces with these incredible people, and yet will show up in different situations with the same name, but it's what seemingly a totally different identity. Um, this is somebody who, according to Cooper, and I'm going to read his, his background on her, is someone who came to him and said, I'm part of this psychic technology group. And um, Valerie had a few interesting qualities. One of them was that um, Cooper uses words like hypnotizing when he's around her and her incredible uh, photographic memory and how smart she is and how many high-level people that she knows. In this period that we're talking about, the early 70s, um, in fact, Gordon Cooper has just come out of NASA because after uh, he was deeply involved in the setup of all the, the uh, you know, the moon program, the spacewalks and all the incredible things. He's one of the original Gemini astronauts and a true American hero. But he was Kennedy's inside man uh, at NASA and among the astronauts. And it's very interesting because as soon as Kennedy dies, he writes there uh, in his bio that LBJ had a totally different vision for the space program. And what I read between the lines is that he was thinking of it more as a war piece, whereas Kennedy had a whole peace science aspect. Um, so the whole war game aspect in space came into play. And Cooper really became disillusioned after helping you know, he was actually going to be on the um, moon landing program, but he was demoted by LBJ for that. So he was not able to be there. Although from everything you can see, he, he clearly deserved to be on one of the moon launch. Um, and uh, we know there's a number of strange, unusual things in relation to the Apollo moonwalks. We're going to go with certain aspects of the official story. Um, and again, one of the things that we've put across in relation to the Apollo program is that it's not so much the idea that we didn't go, but it's more the conditions under which we went. Even the dates may have been very different from what's been put out there. As a matter of fact, where you're going to find, and I have uh, all these Cooper letters that I've been reading through, where you're going to find him talking about is John Kennedy and him and the head of NASA at the time, James Webb, discussing the fact that it's going to take until 1972 to get to the moon. So this could have been another aspect where they knew that they needed the moon program to happen in that decade because the Soviets were so close to doing it as well. There's some strange trade-off that goes on there. And I also wonder if Kennedy, who had called for us to land a man on the moon in that decade, which came in the background from this mysterious figure, Lloyd Berkner, who told him to do that. Um, this is very interesting to me because when we get into that aspect of the space program, we're looking at a lot of strange moves going on in the background. And perhaps Kennedy, looking at it and realizing we wouldn't get there till 72, wouldn't have gone along with the way that things were done. <laughs> I'll put it to you that way. And um, so... What happens is, in fact, Cooper gets disillusioned being at NASA. And even though he's an American hero and he's gone through this kind of incredible period and this credible, you know, uh, heroism. And uh, it's interesting because his own past is a little unusual. As I mentioned, when he's nine years old, he's hanging out with Amelia Earhart. <laughs> 
And uh, he has his first solo flight in a plane at 12. This is very, you know, obviously gifted, but this, these are unusual things. And um, he's somebody who spends half of his life talking about the UFO subject. He does not shut up about it, and he's, he's adamant about it. He talks about his sightings. He talks about looking at films. He talks about others. And he talks about how it's hidden in there by this group that, you know, likes to hold on to that classified information, uh, clearly referencing X-Protect in relation to this. But Cooper, um, as I found out, was going to be in the motorcade in Dallas with Kennedy. And that's the, the level at which he was at that point. And he gets called away two days before by NASA to go to Florida. Instead, he extends his apologies to Kennedy and then says, you know, I'll join you in the, in the next one. And um, he, he was going to be not just in the Texas trip, but in the Dallas portion. That gets us understanding about where uh, Cooper is in relation to this. Kennedy held him in, in incredibly high esteem. What's also interesting, and this is going to is the fact that he and Kennedy talked about the moon Mars program. So it wasn't just we're going to the moon, hey, hey, it was we're going to the moon and we're going to Mars. So this aspect was already active in people's minds and it, there was a very clear delineated path to doing this back in 1960. So it, it's very unusual for us to think that we have not been there and that they're extending you know, consciousness to Mars through Musk and all the rest. That whole thing becomes more like a fantasy when you read the real details. If we already knew in 1960 that we could go to Mars, then there's something quite unusual about all this. The other thing that I find interesting is when he uh, is going into our own Apollo landing, he talks about how they're very worried that the Soviets are going to get there first. And then the Soviets have their, you know, booster rockets ready before ours in May of 1969. And the whole thing blows up. So there's a lot of sabotage all over the place on this. But nonetheless, um, I don't think that the Soviets had the technology that we did. And the great risk was, can we reveal this aspect? And that goes back to the joint moon mission that Kennedy and Khrushchev discussed, which becomes part of the geopolitical turmoil that's involved uh, in all this. What's also interesting is part of what happens with Valerie Ransom and how she approaches Cooper is kind of tailor-made to get all the information that he has. And he was sent up on a number of secret missions beyond what NASA was doing by John Kennedy, supposedly to keep an eye on things there in the hot zone. And everyone assumed it's nuclear that he was supposed to look down there and make sure <laughs> there weren't any nukes around. Later, um, all these things would happen where Gordon Cooper would, um, you know, be included and they'd say, oh, look, he has all these maps. He was looking for Spanish galleons and all this stuff. In fact, um, when he was done with NASA, he joined an archaeological team and they went to Costa Rica. They went, you know, all around Central America and they found Olmec sites. So uh, he was very clued in, but he understood because he had seen things from above. <laughs> And uh, so we have to understand him very differently than just on the level of his astronaut knowledge, which is something some of these groups may have wanted very much. So when we get to somebody like Valerie in relation to Cooper, it's very valuable, one, for what she represents to get him on their team. Now, um, we, can't, we can't know if what she was saying was true. But what she was saying was that she was the representative of a series of telepaths that had been developed by the American government to interface with this extraterrestrial intelligence. And that the extraterrestrials wanted us, you know, to save us from ourselves. And that uh, she had enlisted a number of people to work with her on this project. And because she had these incredible credentials, though young and, and working out of the White House and everything, um, you know, she she had enlisted some remarkable people besides Cooper as well. So he was very, very impressed. And he also understood the aspects of the UFO files. So she was kind of speaking his language in many ways. What we're going to find out is that the people that she uh, was connected with are some of the kind of 
great myths and legends <laughs> on the underground side of the psychic UFO interface for better or for worse. And we get remote viewing comes into that. Uh, we get the whole kind of Yuri Geller, Poharich uh, connection coming into this. But in, right in the middle of it is the actual space program, which Gordon Cooper goes on the record and says, you know, she wasn't an engineer or anything like that, but from a psychic point of view, she revealed things about the space program nobody else could know. That's really telling about the power of this character. It wasn't just, you know, somebody on the fringe who had all these inspired ideas. This is somebody who went to someone as technical as Cooper and said, I have all this knowledge about the space program and the psychic interface. Want to work with us? And it's very interesting the direction that it took. <laughs> We're going to get into that in a moment. Everyone, you're watching The Dark Journalist Show. This is X-Series 163, the Valerie UFO file. The Valerie is Valerie Jean Ransone, and uh, she called herself in later years Lyra Ransone. And there's a reason for that. Um, I wanted to uh, make mention here that we're going to take your questions in the second half of the broadcast coming up here in another half hour or so. You can ask those questions now, and Miss Olivia will be putting them together. And before I go any further, Miss Olivia, what do you got? Gigi says, Pythia, Pythia. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Um, Heidi Reynolds says, uh, NASA had to have foreknowledge of the JFK murder plot, obviously. Well, it's suspicious. You know, the things we brought forward in blue, this is how it goes with the X series. And, uh, you see this in Gigi Young's work a lot too. And, uh, we should all say happy new year to Gigi because mm -hmm. she's been doing incredible stuff and it's great to have her with us. What's interesting is, um, you know, a lot of this information being ahead of the curve, you're going to find it just like with the things we brought forward around ex five years ago. <laughs> you know, it comes out, people start to catch on to it, but it comes out in waves later. And um, so some of the blue information that we're bringing out now in relation to Berkner, Antarctica, and the JFK assassination piece, those things are going to be, you know, much more on the record in a few years. Right now, you're getting this incredible preview uh, through those episodes. But yes, um, you know, when you get into NASA, all you have to do, there's nothing like, you know, serious restricted information about it. Just look at what Kennedy was trying to do with um, Blue Gemini, which is the program for observing UFOs. They had programs for observing UFOs and programs for chasing them. So this is where a lot of the developments in the technology come from. Blue Gemini is crucial because one Gemini is a twin and there's a twin aspect to developing that space program. It's acknowledged on the Kennedy side. And what he's trying to do when he goes to NASA is he says, you're developing this outside of the program we gave you. So who's giving, the, who's giving you orders to make this other thing? The other thing becomes dinosaur. Um, and this is where the clash goes and he threatens NASA to bring blue Gemini to the military, which is not supposed to have any of these space missions. And he says, I'll, I'll give the whole thing to the military because, you know, that's kind of the devil. I know, I don't know what you're doing, splitting this into two programs and like, you know, we're missing access. This is where the whole crucial aspects around the paperclip piece is. We've covered it extensively, but it opens up gigantically when you think about the period after Kennedy, because then you have the actual program that they need to go through with while they're building the secondary one in a parallel. Um, and one of the people in the interface of that is Cooper. That's why we have Cooper deep in the hot zone activity. He's deep on the UFO side. He's working with this ESP woman. Cooper's no ordinary, you know, He's not a John Glenn kind of astronaut. And Glenn's interesting enough as it is, but this is this is certainly unusual. Um, but this is somebody who grew up in Oklahoma, and um, he had a sense for America. And uh, because he was so close to the Kennedy administration, once he lost that access, he was still major in NASA. They still used him, but the fact that they kind of demoted him from being on the actual moon landing and things like that. Um, and also the fact that he was known to be very honest 
made him, I think, persona non grata. And he gets out in 1970. Actually, I'm, I'm leaving NASA. I'm not even going to be a part of it anymore. Um, and before he goes, you know, they, there's a celebration of him after we go to the moon because they basically know out there that he should have been the guy. So something is wrong already with the moon program. What does he do when he leaves NASA? Well, he does a couple of interesting things. He starts this incredible archaeological journey um, where he goes and he, he goes throughout the hot zone, checking out Olmec stuff. But then he becomes a technical director for Disney because Walt Disney was very interested in UFOs. <laughs> and uh, what's interesting, too, is that Disney has a whole, their own version of disclosure coming up in the 70s. They put out a UFO documentary, and this thing is still hard to get. And they were working with the Nixon administration on how should we, you know, roll out disclosure. Those groups were ready early on. And they were like, we've got the stuff. We're going to roll it. And, you know, I'll be the disclosure president and all that. All that gets shut down dramatically. Watergate. And they suppress the documentary that was made um, by the Nixon administration and the Disney one. The Disney one was originally shown on CBS. <laughs> but they had... Gordon you Cooper. You haven't been able to track it down? No, no, you can. Okay. You can. But they, um, you know, it's just in terms of it, popularity and all they put into it. Mm -hmm. And then it comes out and then they take it off the market. It's mm -hmm. just, phew, we don't want to hear about that anymore. And then about 15 years later, it resurfaces. And um, the second version of the Disney series never came out. So whatever they made is not on the record. But I will say this in terms of Cooper. He's somebody who's a key in all of this. But as he's doing this work and switching out from uh, doing this incredible work for around archaeology and then working as a technical advisor to Disney, because he's a great prize for Disney to get as a NASA astronaut, that's when he gets approached by Valerie. And I have to say that when he describes Valerie, he says, you know, Valerie was very hypnotic. She's like one of the smartest, most charismatic people I've ever met. And that she had a striking resemblance to Catherine Deneuve. Hubba hubba. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, I think we're getting some sense that, you know, Valerie really was created in a sense to capture the imagination of Gordon Cooper and others. Um, but at the same time, he's known as a very hard-nosed guy. If you can get past him, we have to take Valerie much more seriously, in a sense, because she was able to get past his own defense mechanism. And um, what happens is they form a company together about advanced breakthrough energy and the study of UFOs. And he is helping to recruit these high-level NASA astronauts, uh, scientists, and all the rest of it on behalf of Valerie and her wild claims of being in touch with extraterrestrials. Um, so somewhere in this mix, and I'm going to jump around in the story a little bit, but this, this will make sense as we go along. Um, he hears about Puharic, Andre Puharic, giving a series of lectures about the psychic interface to space. And he already knows a great deal about this. So he's interested in the lecture. He mentions it to her and she says, I was in a child's program when I was seven and eight years old and Poharich was in, in charge of it. As a matter of fact, uh, they called the program Space Kids and they tested them for their psychic aptitude and they enrolled them and they they studied their, you know, interactivity with space and the, the fact that they get messages and all the rest of it. And then finally, it sounds like they set them up as some kind of ET interface. Now, um, she comes back and they go to this lecture that he's giving, Poharich. And we've, we've, uh, we've done a lot on Poharich. Gigi's done some really interesting videos on Poharich, <laughs> much more revealing than the stuff that's out there. But Poharich is known as somebody who had worked for the CIA and had been in that drug interface of what can people do under the influence of LSD and, and all this kind of thing. So the MK Ultra aspect, the post-war aspect, that's big on Paharch radar. But he also has deep, deep interests in the UFO question. And um, he's involved very deeply with um, the setup of the Nine Group 
And um, this episode is not about the nine, but I will say this in relation to the nine and how it relates to Valerie, which is that, you know, you have people in the nine like Forbes and DuPont and all the rest of it. And um, they believe that they're in touch with an extraterrestrial source, which also influenced the ancient Egyptians. And they think that they're contacting it through this Hindu doctor. And uh, it is Puharich who has taught him how to enter into hypnotic states and bring this information through. So the level of hypnotic ability that Puharich has is interesting when you get around the Valerie question, because Valerie herself seems to have this very hypnotic effect on everyone she's around, in particular Cooper, who often describes getting mesmerized by her, which is pretty, you know, you think about this kind of astronaut military guy, like <laughs> saying that he's being, you know, I mean, he's married and everything. And, you know, he, he, uh, introduces her to his wife and they have all these deep conversations about philosophy and, and the wife's general opinion of Valerie was, you know, I don't know what to make of her, but like, we'll find out. And so the wife is not sold on her. But um, a number of people in political circles, scientific circles, and otherwise, this is a thing that's breaking. Now, one thing I will say about Puharaj, the remote viewing program, NASA, all these things, and the, the aspect that was breaking through in the 1970s was a great acknowledgement around the psychic aspect. This had been breaking through. The Casey work had come out and become bestseller books and things of this nature. So much of the information, the Steiner books are being translated here. Um, so we were getting, you know, much deeper taste of anthroposophy. And um, there was a kind of a surge in the culture around past lives, ESP research, all of it, all the great things that theosophy and anthroposophy had brought forward as public mystery schools now is surging through the culture. And if you go back you and you look at the programs of the period, you know, even the TV shows, they, they all have a UFO episode. They all have a reincarnation episode. This is an advanced culture. The thing that came out of that um, was this kind of 90s renaissance of it. But the, this first wave, I think, in the 60s and 70s is very significant. And it looks like those waves of disclosure, there was a program inside about how they were going to handle this. And that that aspect of disclosure, again, was going to bring us into... Um, their version but the version then was not a ufo threat version they had not arrived at that the ufo threat aspect came as a later uh much deeper project the first thing was secrecy and then you know we're going to let you know about this stuff they were figuring out how to uh, make it to their advantage and at a certain point they pulled away during the star wars piece in the reagan era and they said, we have to make this a threat. That's really uh, where the danger was. That was always sitting in there, even during the Kennedy era. The CIA aspects were wondering, how can we use this as a threat to psychologically terrorize the, our own people in the world? But it wasn't until the Reagan era that it became the actual program to do it. And Cooper has some mind-boggling breakthrough things to say about Star Wars and what it was really for. Uh, which is a lot more in line with what uh, Philip Corso put on the record as well. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. This is X Series 163, the Valerie UFO file, NASA remote viewing, Gordon Cooper, and the Valerie in that case is Valerie Ransone, who's a very mysterious and I think pivotal character on a deep, deep level for this psychic uh, advanced technology group. We're going to be taking your questions in part two of the program before I go any further with you there in the ideas from Miss Olivia Europe. Robert Ayala said, could Valerie be the real subject behind the Val Thor subject in the Pentagon? It's an interesting idea about a parallel there. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, um, the, the timing is different because Val Thor shows up in 1957, supposedly. And uh, here she is in the Nixon White House in 71 and then the Ford White House in 74. She's also a CBS News correspondent <laughs> somewhere along the line, too. And um, But certainly 
you're right that the idea of somebody coming here from somewhere else and actually interfacing with us, what would that look like? There's something very unusual about um, the Valerie story. And I'm going to get to how this interfaces with the idea of these being multi-level people. I've put this on the record about a series of people in history, including Rudolf Steiner, that their legacy of work uh, stretches into different areas so that you're getting almost layers of people. Um, and George Hunt Williamson certainly is somebody like this, Morris and Jessup. And um, this is not to suggest anything sinister. It's actually the opposite. And I know in intelligence agencies, they'll give someone five different identities for sinister reasons. This is different. This is that they reach such a level that they become aspects of individuals and can reach out and do different things. So when you study through on certain people, like Jessup, for example, you find him as this kind of a South American coffee baron on one hand. You find him as a dazzling uh, astronomy professor. You find him as a UFO expert. You find him as the leader of an archaeological team. So these people have multiple lives, and some people are eclectic. But in the way that I track things from the X series side, there's there's a thing, a level they gravitate or graduate to, where they're able to express themselves, and when they do, they can come forward as multiple individuals. Um, and you know, it's interesting because in the case of Gurdjieff. There's a very interesting story. I've told it before, some of his shape-shifting <laughs> stories where, you know, he turns into a prince and <laughs> he does these other things. But one of those stories that's interesting is that, um, you know, Bennett, when he comes back to, uh, the student of Gurdjieff, so he comes back to Gurdjieff after Spensky dies and he's talking with him and um, this woman he's been trying to get to finance Gurdjieff comes up and is talking with him. And she says, well, I know who this guy is. And then it's like, what? She's like, he runs all of the eyelash and like mascara factories in Europe. So, you know, Bennett is like, he looks at Gurdjieff and Gurdjieff gives him like a knowing look like, you know, yeah, she knows what I'm involved in. So Gurdjieff had all these other <laughs> identities, as it were, and here he was running cosmetic industry across Europe. You know, who knows that? You don't find that in the Gurdjieff bios. But there it is on the record. So there is this aspect of kind of multiple individualities and careers and everything when you get up to this certain mystery level. And uh, yeah, the cosmetics thing. you, you Far out. <laughs> I have never heard clip. that before. Um. So when we look at Paharic, then uh, what I find interesting, that's Paharic with his grandfather, Yuri Geller, of course, the Israeli psychic. But Paharic, a very interesting um, peer that he tries to bring to his side. And I'm going to read from a, a, a newspaper article about Aldous Huxley and his meetings. And the thing is, Huxley, um, a lot of people don't understand this because Huxley had relatives who were very, very deep in the machine and in that kind of deep state globalist machine. But Huxley himself with Brave New World and with the vision that he was trying to put out um, was somebody who was trying to move the humanity forward. And this is why, you know, um, in a way, his message was so beaten down. But um he he does a lot of things where he experiments with peyote and things to reach higher states and trying to bring through the spiritual vision. I think what happens is the intelligence agencies manipulate um, the people who are involved with this. There's a group of um, Rudolf Steiner students who are doctors, and they also develop this idea in the 1930s that they're going to make a peace pill by using almost homeopathic type things because they just come through World War I and they're studying it from a natural, organic level. And what happens is this thought or this theme gets pirated. And the CIA-type version that eventually shows up on their side is, you know, that's where they're using LSD. They like the psychedelic vision and all the rest of it. So you can see how 
um, you know, somebody like Huxley, somebody who has more of a large scale concern of humanity and where it's going and, um, you know, the world in crisis aspect, those people are kind of targeted. And in this case, Paharch did it. And it's very interesting, some of the discussion that they have. One of the things, if you go into this period that is associated with Paharich, and it's the 1950s, and it is the use of mind-altering drugs. So um, now what's odd about all this is there's this incredible case of a French village where everyone freaks out, basically. And it's all because, supposedly, they've got this really bad bread. <laughs> Um, but the way that the UFO file and Puharich show up in the middle of that story, to me, is quite fascinating. There's a book about it called The Day of St. Anthony's Fire. And, um, you know, the story basically goes, there's this French village and um, there's this ergot. And uh, what happens is, you know, it basically everyone takes this hallucinogenic drug by accident through this bakery. And they freak out, and there's this, you know, mass riots and all the rest. So um, in 1968, John Fuller published this book about it, and all these things came to light. And how Puharich was very involved with Fuller is interesting. So he focused exclusively on the bread as the cause of the outbreak, dismissing other theories that the townspeople put forward, including the possibility of a chemical warfare experiment. This is very interesting because there were all kinds of things that were being tried against groups and people by the intelligence agencies to see, you know, there's a whole thing about them um, spraying people in the 50s in neighborhoods with DDT, you know, and um, testing radiation on them and doing it, you know, in public to see what kind of reactions that they would get without really letting anyone know. And um, so this story falls into that category very interestingly. I'm going to read you a few interesting details from it and bring it around. Okay, so um, many researchers today will be inclined to look at Fuller as a person of interest in a possible cover-up immediately prior to his book on Point Saint Espirit. Fuller had published an account of Barney and Betty Hill, the first recorded case of alien abduction, an incident that allegedly took place as the New Hampshire couple returned from a vacation trip in Canada. Uh, now, in the early 60s, many researchers have come to the conclusion that thousands of Americans were secretly hypnotized and dosed with LSD. Now, it's interesting because, you know, the Frank Olson case is the most famous one on record where the CIA dosed him, you know, we're one guy was writing down all of his reactions and he jumps out a window and the family sues for 25 years and eventually the case comes out. But they'd been doing this stuff for years. Now, what's interesting is there's a huge interface <laughs> with this story and the Betty and Barney Hill story. I don't. I want to say right up front, I don't think the Betty and Barney Hill story was brought on as any kind of an acid trip. They met, they for sure met with beings. And um, I think the entire experience, however, could have been massaged. And uh, that's something that we're going to kind of get into here. According to the scenario, the alien abduction story was planted through hypnosis to mask the activities of government scientists. The current alien abduction mythology may, in fact, be largely an invention of the national security system as a cover, which might explain why the UFO documentaries and features are so prevalent in the media. Now, this... Um, whole thing was originally a uh, an attempt to explain the story that John Fuller was covering about the, the ergot. And um, I found just a couple of interesting things in there. John Fuller, there are several connections that cast suspicions on Fuller's work, including his relationship with hypnotist Henry Puharich, parapsychology researcher, uh, and most famous is the man who brought Yuri Geller into the the fold. Now, this is going to be important because Valerie, Yuri Geller, and Paharich are going to all be in one big kind of round table around Gordon Cooper very shortly in this story. Um, another connection is Dr. Carlos Osis, founder of Parapsychology Foundation in New York City, a research institute that worked closely with the CIA over the years. You have to understand that um, 
the vision that we have of the CIA and how we understand them is very different than what the group is, in fact. Uh, some of the things that I think we get from researchers about their deep state activity is absolutely right on. But the mystical uh, piece is completely missing about how we understand their research. So they'll say, oh my God, you know, they did programs like remote viewing, you know, they wasted the public's money or, hey, don't they have some weird fascinations with this or that? Well, in fact, it's such a deep part of what the Central Intelligence Agency does is to understand and to work with and manipulate things from a mystical point of view. Um, and this is why different agencies like the FBI would co-op Gene Dixon, for example, who was very close to different presidents because they needed that loop. And in some cases, they may have been fed her stories that became part of her predictive ability. The Central Intelligence Agency was known to have infiltrated the Casey uh, Foundation in 1964, looking for information of the Hall of Records. That's pretty interesting because um, with their programs for finding Noah's Ark, they've spent time and deep, deep money learning the secrets, uh, the mystical aspects that are going on. And so when you get a parapsychology group working with the Central Intelligence Agency, you're talking about ghosts, psychic experience, that whole end of things. What we have to understand is there's a division inside the Central Intelligence Agency. We refer to it on this program as the Astral Agency. They, they have a, a knowledge base that comes from uh, you know, deep, deep mystical traditions. In one case that we put on the record, the Sami culture. And tripped into through the work of John Keel, just incredible uh, research that he did, realizing that all the witnesses were actually seeing Sami people <laughs> dressed up in weird American garb. So um, if you go back into that Sami tradition, you're going to find the reputations of some of the greatest psychics on the planet and uh, how they were feared and revered. But at the same time, they were a very humble uh, culture. But it was well known that they could do what was called throwing visions. So they could basically make you see anything. And uh, a number of Sami were recruited here to America under the idea of training reindeers in Alaska. <laughs> I kid you not. But uh, nonetheless, we had a damn good cover for why to bring them over here and study them and integrate them into these programs. So when we get to the Central Intelligence Agency using parapsychology and Puharich being at the heart of bringing forward these psychics, there's a plus and a minus going on here because in the larger sense of the culture, you have this kind of CIA puppet working with things publicly. and But behind the scenes, you have this much deeper, uh, kind of darker intelligence source piece. And so... Um, what happens is on one hand you get, you know, they realize the culture is running away with the psychic thing, all this information about Casey and all this other stuff, reincarnation. We need to kind of commandeer that with our own, you know, spin it in our own way. And um, I think that you find this also in relation to the UFO file. This is the heart of what we're getting at when it comes to UFO hearings in Congress and things like that. One of the things I wanted to say about 2024 is if we could throw out all the things that Congress is doing, all the things that these phony CIA whistleblowers are doing. And just start with the real thing, the UFO file. It's all there. You don't need any of the sideshow. You don't need millions of dollars going to Arrow, none of that stuff. And uh, you get much closer to the truth. This is the heart of the problem because false disclosure is much worse than no disclosure. <laughs> and there's no argument to that at all because the disclosure that comes through those sources you know, you're better off basically, you know, with nothing rather than the lie. And um, there's so many other ways to get to the truth on that. And we have the material in order to do that. So um, I think that this piece around Fuller and the fact that Fuller brought the Betty and Barney Hill story forward, but was also associated <laughs> with this whole kind of whitewash around the drug psychedelic aspect of this story is also um, quite fascinating as his his association with Puharich and also the fact that Puharich, wherever he goes, there are big waves of UFO sightings. And when he's up there in Maine, 
doing all this psychic stuff, it is in nearby New Hampshire that we get all these UFO sightings and finally the Betty and Barney Hill case, which, as I said, for the record, I think they interacted with something far beyond <laughs> the normal and not just somebody's cooked up in somebody's lab. What have you got? Maggie Smith says, when I talked to Kathleen Martin, she indicated that Betty and Barney were not the only ones in the family that were experiencers. Right. And channeling the heart, Barbara Joyce says, Betty came back with knowledge of Sirius B and amniocentesis, neither of which had been discovered yet. Oh, the Betty Hill star map. I mean, you know, um, that's something that she put on the record in her hypnosis sessions in 1963, and they didn't discover it for another five years. That goes along with um, this whole thing about the Dogon tribe. How are you going to get around the Dogon tribe? <laughs> you just can't. Their discovery and their knowledge of astronomy and that it was advanced beyond ours, you know, and they were some, you know, supposedly primitive tribe in Africa. Uh, you know, these are the the questions and the things that sets traditional history on its head. Um, so I'm going to go past the uh, the LSD part, but you can imagine that the LSD piece fits in here. One thing that I want to say is when the MK Ultra program was revealed and you know, Richard Helms and all these people were like, burn the documents immediately. As if they find out what we've been doing over here at CIA, you know, it's going to be over. And um, so we have this new CIA director who comes in named Colby. And Colby is like, you know what? I'm going to put everything out there and that way we'll gain some trust back. So he starts putting out the level of the psychic interactivity. And the person who stops him is Nelson Rockefeller. Now, Within a few years, both Nelson Rockefeller and Colby will be dead under suspicious circumstances. Nelson Rockefeller went from being vice president to being the favored candidate for 1980, dying of a heart attack in 1979 in his mistress's penthouse. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a weird... In bed with her, right? Yeah. And it's a weird story, though. Um, and then... Colby, you know, decides on a whim <laughs> to go take his boat out at four o'clock in the morning and he drowns. And uh, so many of the people around Colby understood when he's, they got rid of him, you know. Uh, and he, there was a CIA person who was like, I can bring forward, you know, the CIA as a truthful organization that had to do all these dastardly things because we were fighting the Russians. That was where he was coming from. So there was a gigantic knowledge. It's interesting because um, the Kennedy assassination does something very interesting. What we don't understand when we look back at it now, we've got 60 years of history there where they've locked up the truth. But in the 1970s, the idea that the Central Intelligence Agency had killed the president had a lot of currency. People understood it. And so therefore, it made them very, very suspicious. And after Watergate, you know, they were like, oh, you know, this government is corrupt. That was a very good place for the culture to be that aware and we lost that into the 80s and 90s. It just, you know, it went into a different kind of a thing. The 70s were a very, um, you know, they were very aware of the influence of the Central Intelligence Agency and the FBI in every aspect of our lives, opening mail, tapping phone lines, you know, discouraging dissent and all the rest of it. It's all the stuff we came face to face with, you know, after they'd been feeding us years of Paris Hilton <laughs> and all this stuff to dumb us down. And then whammo, you know, they want to lock you up in a COVID camp. This is the nature of how these programs operate. But um, what I can say about the Kennedy assassination is it actually, it was such a distortion that it threw the government into all these different kinds of compartments. And one of the compartments that it threw it into was that an attempt, there was some attempt in the 1970s to get some of that power back from the CIA that no president had been able to do. And that effort uh, included things, you know, there were a number of commissions that studied the activities and the atrocities of the CIA, but all that gets thrown out again when you get into the 80s because the CIA is back in business in Nicaragua and El Salvador and all the rest of it. 
And by the way, when I hear this stuff about the Bitcoin people all wanting to go to El Salvador, all I think about is Jim Jones. Oh. <laughs> I don't want anything about a cult of currency that wants to take me to El Salvador. <laughs> I'm not going for it. Everyone, you're watching The Dark Journalist Show. This is X-Series 163, the Valerie UFO file. Gordon Cooper, NASA remote viewing and the Psychic Technology Group. We're going to be taking your questions here shortly, and we're coming in through the figure Valerie Ransone, a great mystery who is still alive today at the age of 72. And I have a couple of interesting updates about her life that uh, might fit in with all this. Before I go any further, Miss Olivia. You're okay. Up. So the G factor has corrected us. It is Valerie Ranson and not Ransone, although we tried to figure out the pronunciation. I don't agree with that. And oh, no, no. I, and yeah, I haven't... it's Lyra, not Lyra. And I asked oh, if yeah. the G Factor knows her personally. And very cryptically, the G Factor said, I know. <laughs> oh, I know. So I know. So, yeah. no, no, so here's I'm the thing the, the name, this, it's mm -hmm. very simple. It's R A N S O N E. Mm -hmm. The pronunciation the, it is uh, yeah, silent. If, if you, uh, if you, it could be or it could not be, but mm -hmm. you know, as if you go through the traditional channels and you go and ask, how is it pronounced? When you give that name, you're going to find them pronouncing it. A ransom. So, you know, some people might look at it and say Ransoni. Yeah, <laughs> I thought it might She's be. Italian. Mm -hmm. But uh, so, you know, yeah, it's, you know, it looks like there's a few different opinions on that. I suppose Valerie can come on the show and let us know how to pronounce her last name. But in any case, the the core is her story. Um, are there, uh, the Bikini Truth or wanted to know, are there any good books about Valerie? No, no. As a matter of fact, you're going to find that the points we bring forward tonight are the best things on record uh, through our own study. And there's there's very little. They're scant. However, one thing you will find is that there are references to Valerie in two important places, in Gorton Cooper's autobiography, which we're drawing from and we'll read from tonight. And the other one is Jacques Vallée's diary from 1980. And we're going to read from that as well. Uh, we're going to be taking your questions, like I mentioned, in the second part of tonight's program. I want to remind you, if you've just uh, come in, that uh, you want to go to darkjournalist.com and sign up for our newsletter. That's a free newsletter, and it keeps us uh, connected through the incredible, and I mean incredible, censorship that we've been seeing for this program. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the way that they keep us out of search results and like, you know, block notifications and all the incredible things they do to keep this information out of your hands. I think it's because they don't want the kinds of conversations that we have here in the ideas room and on this program and the X series. Um, so, you know, truth everywhere is under attack, but certainly um, the easy way for us to stay in touch is through that newsletter. It's a free newsletter. It takes about 20 seconds to sign up. Make sure you do it at darkjournalist.com and keep us in touch uh, and also supporting our efforts here at this program. You can become a subscriber right there at darkjournalist.com. Incredible. And I mean, incredible things that we have coming up for you in 2024. Documentaries, you won't believe. Interviews, you won't believe. X-series episodes, off the charts, and even uh, events that we'll have set up for you. It's all there in the newsletter. Stand it up and be counted and make sure you're on that newsletter list. Uh, what else you got? Uh, Ida Pangala said, are the deep state players overlords operating subterraneanly? Is this all alien activity coming from below? Um, well, look, uh, I think what's, it's a good question because here's the deal. You have all this let's say 80 years of recorded UFO activity. In fact, it's hundreds of years. And then if you go back into earlier texts, we know it goes much further back, not to any kind of, you know, brain dead ancient aliens <laughs> kind of thing. You know, I'm talking about real hardcore cases of interaction, you know, like the Ezekiel case, which I think everyone can agree upon something different going on there. And remember that in the Casey readings, um, and it's interesting because as I was stuttering the Valerie, uh, studying the Valerie thing, I, I came across the Casey aspects in it. And it's funny when you get into the different things that have come forward, how key the Casey information has been. But um, one of the things that he put on the record about the Ezekiel case is that Ezekiel is looking at 
someone, you know, a, basically someone who had kept the technology of the Atlanteans. And whoever was operating what he was seeing, that was an Atlantean ship, according to Casey. And, but he was talking about the types of ships that they operated in 10,500 BC. And, you know, the Ezekiel story, maybe a thousand BC, 1500 BC, somewhere in there. So, you know, <laughs> there's 10,000 years missing. So the question becomes who kept the technology? Who were the other operators? That's crucial. And I think this is a, a question that Casey laid out there, giving us the Atlantean story. And I have a few quotes from Casey about Arcturus that I think are crucial for 2024 that are going to play a major role. The other thing I wanted to mention about 2024, just as an aside, is um, I think that women and the kind of feminine voice need to play a larger role in the independent media. Well, I think it's really dominated right now and it lends itself to a kind of a lot of you know, grudge matches and all this kind of stuff WrestleMania. <laughs> that men tend to be, you know, that tends to happen. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of bro podcasts and, you know, God bless them. But I think that I would like to see this happen because I think that, um, women understand esoteric subjects on a kind of a natural level. And I think with men, it is a more learned process and thank God when we get to learn it, but it, there's some, there's a kind of a natural interface to psychic topics, uh, esoteric understanding, deeper mysticism, healing, all these different aspects. And, um, I feel like in the independent side in particular, that that voice is very muted and it's overwhelmed with this, you know, uh, I, what I'm seeing a lot with the bro type stuff is, you know, civil war. Yeah. We're going into civil war, you know, get ready, Virginia with machine guns on the Hills and stuff, you know, we're not going to have civil war <laughs> in America. It is not, you know, um, this is not the civil war era. That's not how it would be if they wanted to, you know, get you going. All they'd have to do is hit you with an EMP. Now it's very, very different. And um, I think what's suspicious about what we're seeing on the border is the amount of people coming through who are, um, you know, say, battle age. <laughs> and these are people who are young men with no luggage. And so the person who comes into office and just sends the National Guard to the border and seals it is your hero, regardless of who it is. Because what's going on now is a setup for some type of kind of terror activity. But this idea that like, yeah, let's get into civil war. And like, um, you know, I see a lot of it. There's, there's a lot of people who do that kind of stuff. Jack Posobiec is one of the worst. Um, you know, this is the kind of stuff that I look at and think of is irresponsible. So I'd like to see uh, a different voice in the alternative independent side. That would be crucial because, you know, I've talked a lot about having things be potent, around these topics and you're always going to have fluff headlines and things around it. But I think the other aspect that's crucial is to have, you know, the adults in the room <laughs> kind of piece. And, um, you know, a lot of those adults should be women and, uh, you, you should have a much more of a voice, I think on the alternative side. And, um, I think it's a major influence. And so to hear things kind of going over it, because the idea is, Hey, you know, uh, in the independent media, we're unmasking these things. But then what's happening is they're turning it into like a constant grudge match. And it doesn't, you know, the culture is supposed to move forward with these things. You reveal things, you out the corruption, and then you move on to a better thing. You just don't constantly kind of harp on the qualities of the other side. And I don't think, you know, not everybody who is a liberal or whatever is it doesn't make sense that only conservatives are smart and liberals are brain dead. That doesn't make sense. What's or happened. Vice versa. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing that's happened is um, those forces deep inside, you know, and I think it was like the Bilderberg kind of setup. They've decided how the narratives should go. So even if you get out with one, if people do see the truth, they'll attach this other thing to it, which is warlike and it piggybacks on the awakening aspect in the culture. That's not good either. So we need to find a different kind of voice um, for this thing as it moves forward. And, um, you know, 
that includes things like Tucker Carlson as well. I don't, when it comes to aspects, you know, part of what I look at with 2024 is a large scale critique of <laughs> things that are going because when guys like that uh, are talking about things like the UFO file and all the rest of it, they, they're touting all the CIA lines. They're giving us all the CIA people and that's just a wrong direction for the culture. And what I've said with a lot of this is a lot of the people who came from this like high network level making millions of dollars and then suddenly thrust themselves into the independent space and like, you know, hey, I'm on YouTube, uh, Twitter, and I have the biggest show or whatever coming in with all this support and the corporate kind of, um, you know, push behind the scenes. What they did, in fact, is they vacuumed up a lot of the topics <laughs> rightly or wrongly that were going on in the independent media and they're representing them, but they don't have the deeper knowledge of the people who kind of did the research in the first place. So, um, you know, in the case of somebody like Tucker, he'll talk about the UFO file and he'll say, well, you know how edgy we are. We talk about the UFO file and here's, you know, CIA mouthpiece, Joe, come on in, you know, so this is the nature of the thing. That's not good. <laughs> That's not a good development. So, um, what you have to do again, with all of this stuff is get it down to what's potent, what is actually potent, what's useful in somebody's life and um, who is giving that kind of information out. That becomes crucial because if it's just the uh, intelligence aspect, if it's just the corporations coming in through different channels and astroturfing the whole space that stood up against them and where everybody went to watch their stuff and now they're like, oh, you know what we can do? We can create shows. You know, this reminds me because I'm like a TV historian <laughs> in a lot of ways. If you go back and look at the 60s, a lot of those corporations were like, what are we going to do with all these crazy hippies and all this stuff? And if you look at all their shows, they all suddenly had like hippie clothes and, you know, they'd have hippie episodes, hippie music. And this is how I see what's going on here, which is, you know, a lot of these things have crept in through the back door and, um, you know, Parts of it are good because it, it represents the fact that the independent broke through and took on the establishment and challenged them. But now the establishment is coming in through reinforcements and coming up and with all the topics of the independent and saying, hey, you know, here's the kind of superficial fluff version for you. And, you know, things go on as they were. So that's not the kind of cultural breakthrough, I would say. So I think that's a crucial one for us to I'm get. I'm going to throw in my two cents here. Yes. It's not enough to just be against the mainstream media, to be, you know, anti-establishment. That's right. Yeah. You not need to have, establish your own individual ideals. And, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Who is the psychologist? I'm trying to think. Dr. Phil. I will say this about Dr. <laughs> Phil. There oh was one God. thing that he used to say. He said, like, in a marriage, you, it's really to check in with yourself. You, with every action, you are either contaminating or contributing to the oh. marriage. And, you, and that can be broadened to anything when you have an ideal. Mm. So, you know, when you have a show, right, you can go for ratings. You know, you can go, you know, the audience wants WrestleMania. You can give it to them, right? You can do that. <laughs> or you can say, I have a unique opportunity to contribute to the culture. And what is the best I can do? And really, and keep raising the bar. And that's what we need to ask of ourselves. Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think there needs to be some kind of correction in on the independent side or what is called independent. And, and what's interesting, too, is that what you see is this narrative taking over and they're able to sneak in this whole war drums type thing. But just like the independent side, you know, people beating on war drums and being like, yeah, you know, I hate this liberal figure. Let's invade New York or whatever. I mean, you know, it's sick. It's it's actually at a level of sickness on one hand. And then you have the actual kind of liberal, neoliberal side and their illness against the conservatives. Like both of those things that constitute twin pillars of kind of disaster. So um, I think what we're going to be looking for in 2024 is um, kind of logical, um, and deep uh, consideration around things and less fluff and less, you know, running people over a cliff and 
less accepting of Intel narratives and things, going one at least a half inch deeper on things. So let's go deep in 2024. Mm -hmm. That's the way I would look at it. And more female voices. I think there should be more uh, on the independent side. I wanted to put that on the record. What do you got over there? Oh, I've got lots of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, CC says, should Earth feel lucky that the aliens picked us from the whole universe? <laughs> Uh, depends, I suppose. That's really one of those. Well, it depends, kind of. Um, well, and who's to say we're the only ones? Yes. Let's see if I can dovetail that. This is a good question. What I would say about that is um, it looks like it's part of the natural development for us to interface with things that are outside. You know, there was a much more, there was much deeper understanding of the flow between the spiritual world and this one, say, even in the 15th century. But it turned into a superstitious thing, you know, like with the witch burnings and things where you could just accuse somebody of something and be like, you know, um, so-and-so is talking to an evil spirit and there's no way to check it or whatever. It's just, you know, burn the witch at the stake. And that's how things went. And I think as a culture, humanity got sick of this. And, but it went for a kind of scientific materialism that brought us into a dark place that was disconnected from our spiritual lives. That's where you get the mystery school slapback, the mystery school reaction to it all. So um, this is what we're kind of sitting in the middle of, which is being able to grasp the fact that there are other, uh, you know, entities that we have interplay with. And it's interesting because J. Allen Hynek, um, when he was talking, you know, in private with a friend said, you know what I think we're dealing with in the UFO file and with these alien entities, I think it's in Steiner's book, Theosophy. This is never mentioned. And Steiner's book, Theosophy, has a huge section on elementals. And elementals are something which are not fully corporeal, as we understand it, but are, you know, attributed to things like nature spirits and all sorts of different aspects of beings that aren't fully material. So uh, the, the fact that he had arrived at that, I think is remarkable. Yeah. Um, when humans first were incarnating on earth, there were phases that we went through where we weren't fully corporeal also, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, and it took us a long time. As a matter of fact, we understood and grew with them to a certain level. They just could not fully materialize as we did. So, you know, we lost consciousness of those realms. It's just something that happened. So in a way, were they, are they stuck in a state of grace where we descended into? Well, this is the thing. Mm -hmm. They're just like us in this sense. There are good elementals and bad elementals okay. <laughs> because there are evil trickster ones mm -hmm. as well. And um, you find that deep, deep, deep in the Blavatsky stuff. One of the reasons why the mystery schools shut down the whole mediumship trip and how you know they brought that forward and then they were like oh something bad is happening which is the elementals were impersonating their loved ones who had passed on so someone is going there thinking i'm interacting with you know aunt sue <laughs> who has passed beyond but it's actually an elemental dressed up as aunt sue um and why they would do that there's all kinds of reasons but this is very important and i think gets into a deeper discussion it does enter into this psychic technology piece around Valerie. So I'm going to tell you how. What I want to do is read you just a few comments that Cooper had to say about his time and his interactions with this very interesting enigmatic figure, Valerie Ransone, for now. Um, here's a couple of things he had to say. Right away, I knew she was a smart lady. She had a master's degree in broadcast journalism. She'd worked for network radio covering a Midwest news beat during the Watergate scandal. She then worked for the White House during the Ford administration, helping to develop a national energy conservation program with an office in the new executive office building right next to the White House. She's 21, 22 years old. As a strategic planner, she worked on devising ways to better educate Americans about energy concerns and undertook a thorough examination of big oil and the role of Shell, Exxon, and Mobil in the worsening energy crisis. 
that would lead to long lines at the gas stations. Valerie said she'd investigated alternative energy sources and technologies like solar collectors and wind generators, but found most of them too small scale to service the demand. Valerie had held some important positions for her age, although she carried herself not with arrogance, but with an air of someone who knew her place in the world. She wasted little time getting to the point during our conversation. I have a plan to bring together a group of technical people who have unusual talents, she said. I know Disney is doing some interesting things, but there are other technologies vastly more advanced I'd like you to consider helping me assemble the nucleus for a private advanced technology group. Well, I already have a job, I said. She said, I'm talking about advanced technologies, technologies we need to understand if we are to solve the problems that threaten mankind's potential as a race. And so uh, he goes on listening and talks a little bit. She said a parent group had been formed with offices in Washington, D.C., where she had an office. She explained that a subsidiary, the Advanced Technology Group, would be responsible for testing, implementing new and revolutionary technologies. The people who were involved in this group, I would find referring to the same group as the psychic technology group. So advanced technology, psychic technology. Let's see if we can do that interface in the small amount of time that we have left. We're putting together a network of thinkers, innovators, engineers, teachers, scholars, scientists, and social policy analysts who are ready to contribute the research to design a new landscape for tomorrow. Sounds great. And then she's talking about advanced propulsion, new sources of energy, you know, solving humanity's problems. Uh, why me? Cooper asks. Your credibility from the space program would help attract the best technical people possible, she said. They'll need to build new equipment to prove some of the new theories to the world. We'll provide the context for that to happen. And... Uh, he said, a funny thing happened. The more she talked, the more intrigued I became. I had enough skepticism that I was simply listening, nothing more. At the same time, my lifelong openness to new and unusual policies, both on Earth and in the vastness of space, kept me in my seats. Suddenly, her eyes bore into mine. This is the thing, which is she seems to have this hypnotic length. You must understand, Colonel, I have access to unusual help. I nodded. Then she gave me both barrels. My source of knowledge is not of this planet. She knew my feelings about UFOs and must be putting me on, I thought. It was my turn to look hard at her, but she didn't flinch from my icy stare. From that meeting and from meeting the stream of people off the street with their inventions, I knew that out of every 10 people, three or four were various shades of nutcases. Another three or four like a fellow who'd come in that evening with batteries vastly superior to those of Everready, would be for real. I didn't know yet which group Valerie Ransom belonged. Sounds interesting, I said as casually as I'd say, pass the butter. There is universal intelligence that permeates the earth, she said. The source can originate from any of the numerous points. I know because I'm getting these signals and have been for years. I think we're involved in a grand communication experiment, she said with a smile. This experiment moves the idea of broadcast journalism to a whole new level of possibility. I said to myself, who is this articulate, bright-eyed woman? I started to really wonder about her. The point is, she went on after the waiter came with our entrees and left, there's a significant intelligence source in the universe that wants us to succeed. They were willing to serve as an intermediary so we can evolve as a people and a civilization. But we need to take it on ourselves. And then he goes back in his notes and he realizes some of the early things that he wrote about her. And he said, for several weeks in 1978, a woman whose name I didn't recognize had been trying to reach me at my office. But I was always tied up or away when she declined, and she declined to leave her number. One morning she called and my secretary put her through. The woman introduced herself and invited me to lunch. Lunch, I said, somewhat taken aback. What's this about? I think we have some mutual interests, she said. As I said, there's something about a mysterious woman, and Valerie Ransone turned out to be beautiful, too. She was a brown-eyed blonde in her late 20s who bore resemblance to the French actress uh, Catherine Deneuve. Later on, you're going to find people describing her as Catherine <laughs> Deneuve. That's how close their resemblance was, which I also find interesting because we have that whole thing in the UFO field about Nordics. She really fits the bill. 
Um, just a couple of quick things on her background, and we'll see if we can move this into some of the more striking aspects of what she had to say. Um, by the way, she introduces him to all these incredible high-level scientists, politicians, writer. I mean, you know, she's so connected, it's absurd. Um, Valerie Jean Ransom was born in Illinois to an upper middle class family. Now it's interesting because she grew up close to Paharich. I don't know where their initial meeting was. She said it happened in the super kids thing when she was seven, but, um, just the fact that he, you know, he was within 25 miles of where she grew up. And there's also an interesting connection there with the Stell group. Uh, which is a group I've talked about, Richard Keeninger, and this whole idea of this kind of advanced Atlantean knowledge group that would recruit all these scientists to survive earth changes and things. That also is, that was about an hour away. <laughs> so all this stuff is happening there in, in Illinois. Um, so he's, he says, well, all these people that I met who were associated with her are already were taking the leap, but I was not yet there. I needed more information. It came slowly as in working a giant jigsaw puzzle one piece at a time. And then uh, she said, he says her father was an engineer and her mother a stay at home mom. Valerie had always been a quick learner and excelled in school. I learned that she was born with some unique yeah, abilities, including a photographic memory, a strong sensitivity to energy fields, and an openness to assorted electromagnetic signals. She explained matter-of-factly, some of us just have bigger antenna. She confided in me that when she was 17 years old, 1967, she had her first contact experience while driving home after attending a summer party. She told of experiencing six hours of missing time, there's the apotheum in her life, and it shows up over and over again, and said that her life had been irrevocably changed. After we'd known each other a few months, Valerie went into more detail about her first contact. She said, a, quote, space civilization of beings more advanced than humans had contacted her. This civilization represented the highest minds in the universe and were seeking individuals with unique capabilities. People with whom it could communicate via telepathic transfers, providing technological and other information. She referred to her contact group as UIC. Universal Intelligence Consortium. She said, this intelligence consortium presented this to me as a matter of world peace. I was told that if we succeeded, it would be a national progression of man's evolutionary processes. If we failed, the possibilities were unthinkable. I felt I had no choice but to stumble along and pursue this course in good faith. Valerie said she agreed to be used as a telepathic conduit. She later found out, she explained, that I wasn't the only one who agreed to participate in this experiment. The communication plan, as it was outlined in 1968, sounded rational, as rational as anything that could sound to a 17-year-old. So um, she really had been, you know, under the impression that she was getting this incredible contact. But what was happening was she would get almost technical diagrams and things that were spot on. This is why scientists trusted her. Now, here's an interesting story that's on the record and that Cooper swears by, which is that she gave him information about the space shuttle in 1978, that it had basically a faulty valve and that it was going to explode. And that he went through his channels with his clout to NASA to say, I have information about this and you need to check it out. And that, in fact, her information that she got psychically about this was completely correct and that the NASA directors were thankful but also wanted to know, how the heck did you know this? <laughs> and he went into great detail about it. And um, we have to put that on the record that whatever it was that she was getting and whoever it was she was dealing with, she could get incredibly detailed information. And, you know, the fact that they had known and tried to draw her in as a child into the space kids thing through Paharich and try to recruit her early on. Um, and then she goes and she's advanced through high school, advanced through college, and then gets advanced into the political scene. And now she's creating this psychic technology group. This is somebody who stands at that precipice. She's right at kind of the crosshairs between 
the secret UFO development and the secret programs around psychic development. And then on her own, she believes that she's in touch with an extraterrestrial source. And Cooper, who has been in space, who knows the NASA program very well, who believes in UFOs, has seen the material on an inside basis, and who was President Kennedy's inside man in the space program, Cooper believes her. What does that say about Valerie Ransom. Um, the whole story is quite remarkable. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to encapsulate a number of years in just a, in like, you know, a minute, a minute and a half here. But what basically happens is they develop a company together. And the idea is to develop uh, alternative energy sources and also alternative uh, spacecraft. And then what happens is she, he's fascinated by Tesla, but she knows all about Tesla and she has material of Tesla's that he's never seen anywhere. And she doesn't tell him where she got it, <laughs> but, um, aspects of what he studied and what he puts on record in his own letters and book. And I have one of the letters is that, um, there was a ELF which was this extra low frequency development that happened on our side and on the side of the Russians. And it was discovered the kind of, you know, incredible uh, destructive powers. Uh, and also, you know, it's incredible benefits for humanity, but the destructive powers were such that um, we developed in retaliation for it. We developed the star Wars program and that as a result of developing the star Wars program, the alien interest went off the charts. So wait, that's this is the, really important. I want to make sure I get it. Can yeah. You the, yes. That? The timeline kind of works like this. The ELF developments on the scientific side in America and in Russia lead to the discovery of incredible energy sources, but also incredibly destructive energy sources far beyond nuclear destruction. Um, and, he talks very much about how it would operate. And I'm going to use a quote shortly about it here. But one of the things he said is you could have an entire city and all the people could be destroyed um, through vibrations while everything else stayed exactly the same, kind of like the neutron bomb in a sense. But the ELF weapon that he describes, uh, what he says the Reagan plan was to deal with it was to develop star wars to neutralize the possibility of the russians using it against america although we had it as well um he wanted the ability to basically zap it and that it had nothing to do with nuclear weapons now this is interesting because um for a lot of reasons but it is this development of sdi which attracts greater attention from these outside races so we're getting kind of in deep here. And then when we think about it, maybe there was, you know, a good group that was using Valerie to do this, or they were trying to wrap Gordon Cooper and kind of squeeze him into this project as a way of bringing forward um, a totally different aspect, incorporating psychic and technology pieces for uh, use in creating a, a separate version, a kind of a new mythology through the technology. And we see aspects of this op through all the things that we hear about once in a while. You know, I mentioned this, which I thought was a shocking moment that took place in Congress. And it's Andre Carson, who's this hardcore Democrat, you know, crony for years and years. And he's talking about the UFO file and he goes, it might be interdimensional. It might be extraterrestrial. Stay tuned. That's Andre Carson clunky Congress guy who's usually concerned with, you know, the pork <laughs> in the bills for his district. He's talking about interdimensional entities. That whole piece that Valerie is either bringing through or they're doing a shadow thing to bring it through, you know, it, it may not be the op that she was bringing through. She may have been working on something positive, but the hijacking that occurs, the piggybacking that occurs again. Um, there were versions of this that were floated in different periods of time that try to draw in 
the best people. And um, the version that's taking over now is kind of the most sinister lock <laughs> of the version that we're talking about. But we've gone through this from the moon program, NASA, the Kennedy era, um, you know, the kind of 70s, we're going to have disclosure, close encounters era into this SDI Star Wars defense. Cooper's giving us the reason SDI Star Wars defense is against this ELF technology. And guess who they pirated the whole thing from? Nikola Tesla's papers that were left behind. And what's interesting is Cooper mentions the papers that were left behind and how, you know, they disappeared and other things. But we know the person who went in to investigate those papers is somebody we talk about quite a bit on this program, John Trump. So, uh, who is the uncle of President Trump? And uh, of course, you know, we've done deep, deep research on the president's uncle and his relation to the UFO file being a protege of Vannevar Bush. So now we're moving into territory. We're starting to understand Cooper understands, but he's attributing it to this ELF advanced technology. And he says, I hope that mankind never uses the weapon that Tesla developed. And when he developed, and there was talk of him developing this death ray, he hid his experiments and that's what they were looking for. So it gets us into this kind of mind-boggling territory, and those are the things where he, the Gordon Cooper, and Valerie Ransom become a lock because he's after the same uh, secret of using the advanced technology in a positive fashion, and that's what she is all about too. But her overlay is I'm in touch with these ET uh, intelligence, and they're giving me all this information. Now here's one thing. Valerie gave Gordon Cooper this information about uh, the space shuttle and the fact that it was being, uh, you know, if it had gone up, it would have exploded. It's interesting because the Challenger in 1986 does explode. We're coming up to that anniversary here in January. But that destruction of the Challenger is the final nail in the coffin of the Kennedy manned space program because Kennedy created the program. And he was the one who was like, we have to have manned astronauts in space and uh, space needs to be a war-free zone. There can be no weapons in space. And Challenger is the last of that. And when that goes up, it gets blown up. You have to wonder if Valerie's group weren't aware of the sabotage that was occurring on the space shuttle for 1970, when she says it in December 78, the launch is for 1979 and she saves the launch. So there's something incredible happening right in the, the middle of all this hair. And we can kind of get our, our hands on it. If we can go through it in kind of a X <laughs> with that X tech in mind, everyone you're watching the dark journalist X series. This is uh, X series 163. It's the Valerie UFO file. Valerie Ransone is the individual that we're talking about still alive and uh, an incredible background, incredible career. Strange things happened to her along the way. And rumors came back to Cooper, in fact, that I'll, I'll read here, that she died. But she didn't. Uh, and he found that out, too. And he had lunch with her much later um, in the 90s and talked about how he felt their efforts were sabotaged. And um, she started a kind of a you know, scientific healing center in Hawaii. And then... Uh, I found stories of her, very interesting story with her that was relatively recent about her uh, helping to save someone who had been attacked by a shark in Hawaii. Um, I've reached out to uh, Valerie to come on this program, and I hope that she sees it fit to do that and explain what was going on with all of these things, but she's maintained a pretty low profile. Uh, we'll see if she does or not. In any case, she's welcome to live her life <laughs> in private. What's crucial, I think, is what she was dealing with and the interface point of the forces that were using her to create the psychic technology group and how that relates to what we're seeing in this 2024 push. I have more uh, to add on the record here, <laughs> lots more, 
And I'm going to read that along with uh, some very interesting quotes from Jacques Vallée about Valerie. But I think it's time that we go to Miss Olivia's questions. Okay. Wow. I got to tell you, that last piece... I could feel the ideas room get really quiet. Uh, yeah. Really listen intensely. No question. That was incredible. It is. I was blown away by that. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sort of, I, everybody's holding their breath, including me. Um, the Bikini Truther says that ELF thing sounds like leave the world behind when they had the noise that made the boy's teeth fall out. Mm. Uh, Twilight Miss says like D-E-W, but for biological life. No bueno. And the Philip K. Dick Film Festival says Tesla Death Ray uses resonance frequencies, ELF, to break the earth like an apple. Yes. Um, this is something we got into with Dr. Farrell, and actually is to break it in half. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, one of the things that he developed, the kind of, you know, the good aspect he was trying to develop is he said, look, with the development of the Nazis, you know, if you want to prevent them from overrunning Europe. I have the tool for us to do that. He was trying to figure out a way to bring his technology, which was so advanced to humanity, which had misused things, had misused him. And um, he was still trying to have that incredible healthy impact. Now, um, it's interesting because in the Casey readings, the death ray comes up as something the Atlanteans had and that they used in 50,722 BC one of the very few times that Casey specifies an actual year. But he says that the use of that technology in 50,722 BC split the Atlantis continent into three islands, um, Arian, Poseidia, and Og. And those cultures developed after that as those three separate islands. But then again, in 28,000 BC, the two-eye stone death ray crystal was set too high. He used the term death ray and he said, this is what is commonly referred to as the death ray. He's talking about the news reports about Tesla's death ray. Remember that Tesla came in and got a reading from Edgar Casey in 1918, but that reading and the copy of that reading disappeared a long, long time ago. And the Casey administration foundation, ARE doesn't have it and the Tesla papers don't have it. Somebody has that reading. We can only imagine the kind of Atlantean details uh, right in the heart of it. But it's good to know that Casey, direct with that mystery knowledge, interfacing direct with Tesla, who Valerie says was getting all of that inspiration from an extraterrestrial source who was trying to give us energy to move the culture forward. These are the things, these are the aspects, I think, uh, yeah, what do you got? Jimmy Lyle Kenimer says, DJ, do you think she was part of an organized X-share group? If so, which? Uh, yeah, here's another thing, which is she could have been part of an X-share group that they were piggybacking on the X-Protect side to pilfer the knowledge of people, say, like Gordon Cooper. So there could have been... Um, there's no question that with Paharich involved, things get very dicey, but also she's led into very high levels of government. So then you very wonder. Very young, right? Yeah. You have to wonder about that. They recruited her, obviously, because of, you know, she's basically on a genius level. And they, they wanted that. But this other aspect with her believing she had a, a contact that was kind of like the Betty and Barney Hill contact. You know, it gets us into very, very tricky territory, but she's working with the top people. And Gordon Cooper, let's face it, Gordon Cooper, <laughs> he's, you know, he's an Oklahoma guy, a military guy, top in the space program. He doesn't have to listen to anybody. He's not going to go over a cliff for somebody, but he listened to her. He worked with her. He formed a business with her. How long were they, uh, you know, in business uh, with each other? How in business for about them? five years, from okay. 77 till 82. Mm -hmm. And um, when did Cooper die? Or 78 to 82. Cooper died in early uh, 2000s. Okay. Yeah. And um, this thing came out afterwards, you know, about Cooper's treasures. And um, some, of, some of the things that he was doing in relation to space in the hot zone and JFK started to tumble out because it was known that he kept coordinates in his head because he had a photographic memory like she did. And um, 
there's also a very interesting thing where he's sent up to do a mission to take, do all this photography. And then he says, oh, I have to know because I'll do the photography. I, I want to do it for the public. If you want to do like private photography, maybe you can send somebody else out there to do a classified one. I want to do the one where we show everything to the public. And they say, okay, this one will be public. So he goes up there and when he lands after doing this, you know, orbit around earth and taking all these pictures, when he lands, military people come and grab him and they grab his film and they basically hold him in detention. And then he gets to meet the next day with LBJ and he says to LBJ in a pretty ticked off way, you said I was doing this for the public, you know, what's the deal? And LBJ says, I made a classified boy. That's all you need to know. So he never gets an explanation for that. And he really dislikes LBJ. You can feel it. Like he, I think he knows that LBJ was involved in the Kennedy assassination. And um, in 1997, he's at a barbecue. And this guy comes up to him and says, I was part of the team that arrested you that day when you came off the capsule and confiscated your film. And he said, really? <laughs> He said, I remember how angry you were. He's like, you bet I was. He said, why did they do that? And this old guy says to him, you took pictures of Area 51. And, you know, <laughs> like, we didn't know you were going to do that. And um, here's Cooper writing 1997. He goes, is, as of 1997, the government still has not acknowledged this site. I took pictures of it in the 60s. What are they hiding there? Cooper wants to know what they're hiding. He was on the inside of NASA, on the inside of these programs, and he knows that the government is hiding those things. I think that's a great message from the past to us about exactly what was going on. And now we are kind of in this outcome period of all that, those levels of secrecy. That's what we're talking about uh, here with the focus of the X series. And, you know, in the work of people like Gigi Young, you know, we're getting to that core piece. This is very important for us to remember. And what I think you need to remember out there, watching in the ideas room and getting this, which is there's a reason why the secrecy holds. And there's a reason why there's a false disclosure a movement. It's crucial not to fall for it. And it's crucial, you know, to take some of the stories that we bring forward on this, people like Dr. Farrell or Gigi, as I mentioned, coming at it from these levels, from this potent level, then these things begin to make sense. Then we're not caught behind the eight ball of a false uh, UFO emergency or a false version of disclosure. Or, hey, look, you know, David Grush is going to bring you <laughs> alien bodies, or, you know, Chris Mellon is commandeering the whole thing. And, you know, we see the nature of the players. And, uh, you know, of course, I, I mentioned that I had this phone call with Grush before New Year's. And we talked and we had an off-the-record conversation. And um, one of the pieces of advice that I gave him was to get as far away from Chris Mellon and Lou Elizondo and the op if, if he was legit as possible. And that's the thing, I think, that hangs in midair in relation to Grush. Because if you're COO, you know, of their foundations and things like that, you're part of the op, whether you know it or not. So that's a crucial thing. You either stand in integrity for what you're doing. If you have the integrity, use it. Be the man and bring forward the truth. Or hide with the cowards that are going to bring forward false disclosure. The choice is yours. You know, no... No phone conversations are going to change that. It's going to be your choice. That's the only advice that I could give you, uh, you know, and that's the only advice I could really give him. Uh, and, you know, I hope he takes it. Right. Be fearless. Right. In Look, 2024, really seriously, do we, we have nothing to lose at this point, right? Everybody's well, got to step up. If you're supposedly fearless. going to take down a worldwide UFO secrecy network and be afraid of Chris Mellon, that's, doesn't add up. You're going to have to choose what you're going to do. And, uh, you know, I understand <laughs> what's involved, but then a lot of people don't even know if somebody like Grush 
is just doing it at their behest, you know, for the rest of the op. So you're going to have to either separate yourself if you're somebody like Crush from those people. You can't be in organizations with them or have them supporting what you're doing. Then it just, the whole thing makes you look like you're part of the crooked CIA disclosure. That's not good. <laughs> those are just the facts. Okay. You know? All right. Happy camper. This is a great question because it's so basic. Yes. Uh, what is so special about the UFO file that it is warranting all this? <laughs> We'll start with X series one, <laughs> <laughs> actually go back, just go back to, uh, you know, the, the episodes that we've done on the UFO file from the start, the UFO file. That's a real good question. <laughs> and I thank you for asking the UFO file is, um, it represents Remember, the X technology is sitting in the UFO file. This is crucial. So the UFO file is not just extraterrestrial interaction. It's not just there are spaceships from an off-world civilization visiting here. That's one consideration that would be around it. But um, the X technology itself represents such a leap and such a difference in everything that humanity has done up to now. But the X technology is very old. It's ancient. It relates to our own consciousness past in Atlantis. That's what the mystery schools brought forward. That's what the two eye stone story from Casey is all about. Why does Casey have that two eye stone information out in the public? Why did the CIA try to break in and find out what he was talking about? Um, the reason is that hidden technology is something that one, they want to get their hands on all the aspects relating to the X technology. What they have relates directly to the Tesla program on one hand, which is an X technology and the UFO file. What happens, there's an effect involved and Cooper was getting at it with his ELF thing, but the apotheum effect is the thing in my opinion that delineates a secrecy level. It's like, if we don't do this, reality stops. That's the level of which they're on. So they want to be able to develop that advantage of having it. It would be like having a totally new, improved weapon and energy source. But they haven't mastered the ability to control it. And so Apothium is very unpredictable, and it has a reality distortion field that is, shows up in all of the UFO cases. And, and that includes Valerie's missing time. Time ceases to act normally. Reality bends, you know, people go through walls when they're abducted, things of this nature. So Apotheum, A-P-O-T-H-U-E-U-M, that's the shorthand that I use for the whole thing, Apotheum. And um, that effect, just sit down and read, forget about all the junk, you know, Elizondo and all that stuff. On the real UFO side, read a series of abduction books like Ray Fowler's or John Max. And just read the types of experiences that the people have. So it moves them through time, beyond time and space. It moves them through physical objects. It completely turns the regular levels of universal physical reality upside down. That's the reality distortion field in the UFO file. That's the thing that they can't aim. They don't know if they aim it. It's a boomerang. <laughs> um, so there's that aspect of it. And that's where the X protect level comes in. Now they want the control of the advanced side of it and to leak it out to the public. You know, we, we called it breakaways, breaking back in, right? They want a way now that they've kept the technology hidden for so long to let out aspects of it with a story. And that's why you see these phony congressional situations with UFO whistleblowers and things of that nature. The CIA or the Congress don't want the public to have any of the truth around the UFO file. That's a fact. Uh, that's why they've hidden it for so long. That's what they're good at, you know? So um, we have to take it at a totally different level. We can work with people in government, you know, who are for transparency. There are some, but that's not where the full transparency is going to come. You're going to come through a different channel for it. And uh, a lot of this... Uh, publicly available. Valerie's story with Cooper, what we know of it is, is a window 
we still we can pick up the trail of what we're talking about. So um, this goes back to the mystery schools hiding that technology as well because they thought in the wrong hands, as we know in Atlantis, it distorted everything. It almost set off Earth's evolution entirely. That's the first of you know massive worldwide destruction that was caused by humanity was the Atlantean two-eye crystal. And again, it was developed by a noble group in Atlantis, the Amelia's group, who were trying to do what? They were trying to contact, this is Casey's version of the story, they were trying to contact groups in the outer sphere, the saintly realm, as, as Casey called it, and they would download <laughs> that interface, those messages. That's what they used the technology for. So the Belial group, which are the heroes to the globalists, the WEF crowd, you know, Ghislaine Maxwell, Epstein's, all those people, what they were looking for was that connection with that original Belial cult, the summoning, as it were. That's why you had, you know, we had all these ridiculous stories about Stephen Hawking and an orgy and all these memes and stuff. Look, if you go to the Colonel in the Hot Zone episode, you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna see what Stephen Hawking was doing down there. We put it on the nose, and Hawking was actually in a submarine called Atlantis, palling around with Epstein and Maxwell. They were in the hot zone. They were studying the Atlantis Poseidia piece. That's the big geopolitical secret in the middle there. Yes. Right. Maxwell was the one piloting the submarine for him. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, she's a, a submarine and helicopter pilot, mm -hmm. which I think is comes in pretty handy when you're in the hot zone. <laughs> what do you got? Okay, Jessica Rodriguez says, we have to understand our ancient past and the secrets it held and what we have forgotten. We are a species with amnesia and the truth is held up in the hands of the few that rule humanity. And Philip K. Dick Film Festival says, John Mack always referred to the UFO experience as ontologically different from our reality. That's the other piece of uh, yeah. of all of this is, is just knowing who we are as a species and our history, our shared history. Yeah, but this is what I remember about, I met Mac on a series of, uh, in a, at a series of, of different meetings, and uh, I had a friend who worked for him. And I remember, uh, I've mentioned this story, but um, I expected to hear, you know, hey, <laughs> you know, what's the UFO stuff that he's working on? One of the things she told me is, she said, oh, he is studying, uh, he's training abductees to use astral travel not to get abducted. <laughs> Think of how, you know, I was like, oh, man, they're doing the real stuff. You know, that's how advanced Mac was. And um, what I remember about Mac is that he was a very curious guy. And uh, I met him when I was 18, and the impression that he made of me, I still remember him. He was very interesting. Guy, his work is remarkable, and he he took no end of you know a hassle as a Harvard professor for standing up for this. Time Magazine went after him. Everyone called him a kook and everything. But putting it on the record then, when they were really resisting it, I think um, there's a lot of powerful aspects in his work. And uh, I'll never forget that really close friend of his who said that you know. After he died, he came to her in a vision or a dream. And, uh, you know, he died. He was run down when he was, he came out of a conference in England and he was run down um, by a car. And it's interesting because the story, it's very strange, but her story was interesting, which is she said that he came to her and he said, the UFO thing is nothing like what we thought it was. I thought that was interesting, and um, that's kind of <laughs> something to keep in mind. But no elaboration on that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yes, Miss Olivia. Okay, the Philip K. Dick Film Festival again. Did Valerie ever reach out to Edgar Mitchell? Uh, who, of course, has studied consciousness? You know, I wouldn't be surprised. She, he seemed like he would be exactly up her alley. It seemed like... Um, you know, there's a scene where things are going great. They've put together this thing. They have these high-level meetings. They're at the White House. You know, they're doing all this stuff. And then um, communication with her gets a little strange for Cooper. And then she shows up 
in his office and she looks incredibly frazzled. Like she's been interrogated or something. And uh, she talks about how the groups, you know, these UFO groups that are contacting her, that there was a great battle between them and that she was kind of being the volleyball in the middle. And it seems to me that right after that, things start to slide for them. And I think that once she doesn't seem to have that singular, you know, once things start to go wrong, I think that Cooper starts to look through her and say, you know, she gave me good information. She was the real deal, but something has gone off the rails here. And also it's affecting her badly. And they lose communication for 15 years. I mean, that's quite remarkable. Um, In between there, an interesting thing happens, which is, you know, in 2016, Jacques Vallée released a lot of his diaries from the period when he's looking into all this UFO stuff. Some people like Jacques Vallée and some people don't uh, to say that he's a UFO researcher and uh, he's got a lot of you know, books out there and uh, he's, you know, he's, he's one of the more credentialed guys, I guess, in the field. But here are some of his entries about Valerie that I think are telling considering what we know. And uh, I've got more <laughs> here about Valerie from Cooper too, but let's see if I can condense it all into a straight line. Okay. On my way through DC, I spoke to Kit Green. You remember Dr. Kit Green? He's a CIA guy involved with uh, the remote viewing program. Also, interestingly, he's the guy who put the term the breakaway civilization <laughs> on the map before any of the UFO researchers or anybody had it. Uh, and, and he, you know, he knew, he, he knew them. Uh, I spoke to Kit at length at the Marriott at Dulles. He told me some UFO contactee named Valerie Ranson was in La Jolla after some sort of crisis, October, 1980, February 81. Kit came to me last night. Little has changed, but he had news of contactee Valerie Ranson. Skip four years here. June 1985, Richard Nietzau. Richard went to tell me, went on to tell me about his activities with John Schusler. John Schusler, people may remember, is the guy who set up MUFON. In Houston, in the days when Valerie Ranson was stirring up ufology, when we entered the offices of the organization where she worked, all phone conversations stopped, no documents were visible on their desks, we were asked about our research and left with no new information. We're convinced the group worked for a clandestine outfit. Gets more interesting. Richard Nietzsche. This leads us to a wide ranging discussion of the role of various agencies in the UFO business. This is July, 1989, getting a little further down the road now. We came to talk about with Kit Green. Richard reminisced about the time when he and John Schusler were almost recruited by a woman who claimed to be working for a private investigation service in Houston. When they came to her office for a meeting about UFOs, they found a dozen people working behind their desks, which were so neat and devoid of paperwork as if to seem unnatural. And they quickly came to the conclusion the whole thing was a setup. Was the woman named Valerie Ranson? I asked Richard. He seemed puzzled to find that I knew her and about her operations. Did you ever find out who she was working for, I asked. I confess that I'd researched her and I had not. Schusler tracked her down through the channels, he said. His channels at McDonnell Douglas. It turned out she was an agent for the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office. David Grush works with the NRO. Mm-hmm. Working with the Navy. Kit Green, who took care of her medically, Hmm. once told me that she was amazing. She knew four times as many people as the both of us did. Now, took care of her medically. That's pretty interesting because Kit Green, you know, psych. Uh, so was he her psychologist? I guess this is interesting. There's something else, Jacques. When I revealed to Kit over lunch that I knew her affiliations, he practically choked on his food. 
He told me not to mention her again at the restaurant. I've only had that reaction from Kit twice in all the time I've known him. So the fact <laughs> that she had worked for the NRO and these other affiliations shocked Kit Green, who'd been treating her, I guess, for years. So would the assumption be that they were being recorded? Yeah. He didn't want anyone. He said, don't mention her again at the restaurant because now he knew her level of intelligence mm -hmm. and um, of her intelligence connections. Kit Green, you know, he worked at deep intelligence levels. He's still with us, still around. August 24th, 1988. Kit's involvement also appears in connection with Valerie Ransone. According to Neemsau, the guy they mentioned earlier, he was her medical handler. Here we go again, medical handler. It is through her that Neemsau met Kit. She put them in touch with each other. Then following the famous episode in which Schussler and Niebsau found themselves being recruited by Valerie's outfit in Houston, where they walk in and this team of workers who's supposed to be represent this company, they're like, they don't have any paperwork in front of them. They're not on any phones. Like what, who are these people? <laughs> Were they aliens? I mean, you know, it makes the head spin or are they agents, you know, uh, when you can freak out a CIA person, you're doing pretty good. <laughs> Speaking of trying to locate evidence of an active black project, I said, what about Valerie Ransone? There's no follow-up in that entry. <laughs> but here uh, is Jacques Vallée saying Valerie Ransone's a black project. December 1989. Speaking of Kit, there are several burning questions I would like to put to Kit. Who was Valerie really working for? Um, and then, so we go from there. The only thing I can tell you is that, uh, she had changed her name. Uh, and this is not a doxing thing because, you know, there, she has a few public things out there, but, um, as I said, I've reached out to her and she doesn't respond, uh, as far as I can tell, but since they're public, I, I feel like it's okay to, to mention that she changed her name to Lyra. Um, and, uh, did you want to say it's Lyra? Supposedly it's Lyra. <laughs> the Lyrians. I have heard the Lyrians before. Uh, and of course that is a star cluster and there's a star thing about Arcturus. I'm going to read before we're done tonight. But what I want to do with wrapping up about Valerie, uh, Ransone is this. Basically she wrote something called the universal intelligence consortium. Conversations with an interdimensional correspondent on the coming earth changes. And it seems like her life became dedicated through this organization in Hawaii to studying and spreading information about earth changes. And it seems to me she was involved in kind of like medical charity work. So really kind of fulfilling that um, kind of noble aspect that Gordon Cooper was um, you know, had, this is what his impressions of her were. And it seems like her life went like that. I found a picture of her working with this medical team, uh, from just, uh, 2020. So she, you know, she's still out there and still doing this kind of charity style work. Um, so, there was one other thing with the Jacques Vallée piece. It was our first hint of NRO and UAP comes in the form of an individual named Valerie Jean Ransone. In 1976, Ransone, who was said to be a former CBS correspondent and a Washington power broker, established herself as president of the Information Network, an alternative radio network. In that year, Ransone also met Andre Paharik and spent several months with him exploring every site where research on extremely low frequency radiation was being conducted. Because ELF waves can penetrate seawater, they've been used to communicate with submarines. Um, so Cooper and Ransone set up, a, the company was set up to uh, develop worldwide free energy transmission and advanced medical devices. And there was a, a space connection. So, um, her, the fact that she was found out to have worked at the NRO, which is highly secret organization. And what's interesting, it's under, it's one thing to talk about the NRO now, but 
the National Reconnaissance Office, which was put up in 1962 by the Kennedy administration, was a secret satellite organization. And it did not get disclosed to the public until 1993, 30 years later. There were rumors about it. But the fact that she worked at this secret organization in the 70s, if you worked at the NRO, it's like working at X-Protect, I mean, or X-Share. Nobody knows that it exists. So I want to flash forward a little bit now and think about people who are working for organizations, especially when you see like this, they're trying to convert the UFO thing into this phony UAP idea or NHI and all that kind of nonsense. What's going on is there's an organization that's already in place, that's already dealing with the UFO file. And then 30 years from now, we're going to find out, oh, they already had that thing back then. That's what's the thing that we were hearing about. <laughs> Only it's not going to take 30 years this time. So um, I think it's important for us to keep that in mind, which is the secrecy of her position working at the NRO. Now, it's weird because she works at the NRO, one, two, she's in contact with an ET intelligence, and she's giving information to Gordon Cooper that saves the space shuttle. I mean, this is an incredible uh, interface of forces that are working through this individual. Go ahead. It's like a movie plot. <laughs> it really it's is. really hard to believe it's not? real. I mean, she's quite a discovery. Incredible. Yes. Um, David Tremina says, Kit Green was famous for operating the CIA, quote, weird desk. True. Um, Jewel of Aquarius says, does DJ think the UIC could be the Council of Nine or similar? And Fern Folks says, DJ, was she a mystery school participant? Well, you know, sh her, her language is very mystery school-ish. And um, she comes off as somebody who is gifted. She also, she may be programmed to a degree as well. They may have used her own idealism against her to recruit people like Cooper. Uh, or again, uh, the other opportunity that I see here is that she could have been a genuine move by the X-Share people to take the UFO file and use it to this positive disclosure aspect. Because remember, Gordon Cooper wrote that letter to the president of, uh, well, to the head of the UN with the president of Granada and um, saying, you know, we know UFOs exist and it's it's time to basically use the UN to interface with these ET intelligences and things. That's 1978. That's when he's working with her. So she's having a major impact. She's in the Nixon administration. She's in the Ford administration. She's working with some of the best scientists and psychics so this is not, um, you know, a flight of fancy and what she was up to now, what she was doing with Cooper unraveled, but what I see is it looks to me, and I want to go back to the Reagan aspect because when Reagan developed star Wars, we have stories from Philip Corso that they're developing it in relation to repelling ETs. Um, and for the UFO question. <laughs> However, Cooper is also putting on the record that the development um, of SDI and Star Wars by the Reagan administration is to counteract the development in Russia using stolen Tesla plans of this massive weapon, ELF weapon. And that it's our development of Star Wars that that's what attracts all this alien interest, uh, for want of a better word. That's a pretty, uh, you know, if you think about it, with his knowledge and the fact that he'd done spacewalks and the fact that he was Kennedy's man on the inside, for him to come to that conclusion, this is very different. This is something I think historically that was missed, which is, you know, and he mentions the the papers of Tesla being stolen. He doesn't mention who went in and got them, but we know John Trump was the person who went in and studied them for the FBI and the alien uh, office, illegally alien. <laughs> so um, with John Trump's knowledge through Vannevar Bush, through the UFO file, this then becomes a huge schism going on.
there's a huge clash of factions and skill sets and things. So if you know about the UFO file, you have all of this secrecy level aspect. But remember, the X technology is both, it resides in the UFO file, but it's both what you get from this UFO aspect, but it's also in the Tesla work. It's in the Keeley work. It's in the mystery school stories. So that technology piece, apparently, uh, according to Cooper, the Americans were convinced that the Russians had developed this ELF weapon from stolen Tesla material. That's a mind blower. And that's where we get SDI and SDI brings in the UFO interest <laughs> to a, a much more advanced level. Yeah. So right. mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> more information about SDI, obviously. Um, and I, I'm, I have uh, quotes that I'll read about that too, but keep rolling. Uh, Brenda Fisher says Lyra in Greek mythology represents the lyre of Orpheus, Orphic circle uh-huh. connection. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. Isn't that interesting? Um, and of course, Orpheus went into the underworld, right? Well, it's interesting. Yes. And she, um, Valerie set up a corporation in the nineties in Hawaii and she called it heaven sent, but it was the Hawaii term for it. I have it written down here. Um, I thought that was, you know, something else because, you know, here she is like, she's looking for heaven sent technologies. Valerie shows up uh, as somebody who I think inspires Cooper to really come forward with his UFO knowledge. The thing is, it's possible that the NRO was recording all of her interactions with Cooper to get, what does he know about the UFO file? This guy's a loose cannon. What do we need to do to him? (laughs) He's an astronaut hero. We don't want to bump him off, but you know, what are we going to do with him? Is he going to go out there and like start talking about his ancient Atlantis uh, discoveries in Honduras. And uh, is he going to talk about what he really saw in space? You know, there are a lot of problems with him from a security standpoint. And Valerie, you know, she might be thinking, oh, I'm getting this guy on board with my team. But if she's working for the NRO, she, you know, they may be basically uh, dialing into everything that they do. And they open a company together. That's pretty close. Here's what he had to say. And I think this is the crucial quote because, you know, I gave you my best take on what Cooper, Gordon Cooper, the astronaut, head of the Gemini program and Kennedy's man inside on NASA. This is directly from his autobiography. Upon his death, Tesla's hotel room was immediately searched by FBI agents looking for the design of the death ray machine. Remember who they sent in, John Trump. Supposedly, his scant notes were all turned over to his native land, where a Tesla museum was built in Belgrade. The push behind our 1980s Star Wars missile defense system was widespread fear that the Soviets had begun deployment of weapons based on Tesla's high energy principles. Reports of mysterious blinding of U.S. surveillance satellites and the evidence of radio signal interference gave credence to those concerns. I can only assume that if low-frequency weapons research is underway in the United States or elsewhere, it must be cloaked in the highest level of secrecy imaginable. I pray it will not be Nikola Tesla's final legacy to mankind. So, uh, (laughs) you know, even for him to go on the record that far is pretty, you know, they must have been very nervous about this guy. And, uh, The fact that he knows all this stuff about SDI Star Wars, even though he's been out of NASA for, you know, since 1970, (laughs) he still has his his connections in there. Um, And I will say this, that um, when things split off with Valerie, I'll just read his little description of how she comes in and she looks like she's been through interrogation or stuff. And this is when things go awry with the Valerie Ransone Gordon Cooper partnership. Two weeks before Dan Fry and I were to take our extraterrestrial saucer ride, this is what they were planning to do. They were planning to interface with the intelligences that were giving her this information. Gordon Cooper took her that seriously. And there's a guy back there who was part of the 50s, 60s wave 
of UFO contactees. Dan Fry, and he'd worked for Lockheed. He was an engineer who had a lot of credentials, and his story was wild, that he was basically, you know, uh, at the Lockheed plant at one point, one of these huge ships came and he had all these interactions with them. So when Cooper met Dan Fry, he said, I can't believe that they, people don't take this guy more seriously. <laughs> uh, so he says two weeks before we were going to, you know, supposedly go out into the desert and this, there was going to be this meeting or whatever. Valerie Ransone showed up at my office looking as if she'd been dragged behind a tractor. She was also terribly depressed. She would say only that there had been some strong disagreements among certain parties about Dan and I taking a ride on a UFO, and that ride was off. <laughs> was someone teed off, I asked. She nodded. Will it be rescheduled? After all, I was accustomed to launch delays. Now it's not a good time to talk about it, she said weakly. I was disappointed. Dan and I had both been meticulous in our preparation to document this UFO flight. As instructed, as the date approached, my anticipation had grown measurably. Unfortunately, it was no flight director with whom I could now appeal the decision to scrub the mission. I would later learn from Valerie that she'd been directed to go out into the desert. Um, and she became disoriented and confused by an array of scrambled transmissions. So it sounds almost like she was attacked by an energy weapon or something. And she comes back, you know, this kind of beautiful collected woman, all frazzled and disheveled and uh, looking like she'd really been through something that jumped out at me. And the fact that when people tracked her back, that she was in the NRO jumped out at me because Gordon Cooper doesn't mention it. I wonder if he was even aware of it. That for me becomes, makes her an even more enigmatic story. And to me, she's right She's right in the interface of that secrecy of the UFO file and this other thing. And uh, she is as X as you can get. She's right in the heart of the X. She, she really is. is. <laughs> Whew. Yeah. Uh, and it goes deeper. It goes deeper. The question is, um, you know, would she come out of retirement to talk about it? Please. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a polite ask. And um you know, I don't want anyone to help hunt her down and stuff. I actually, I have her personal info and I've reached out to her. So let's see. Let's see what happens. Um, what does she get? I'm not dead yet, says Valerie may appreciate that we as a civiliz civilization are more awake now and would appreciate her knowledge. She may want to disclose but not be willing to have knowledge be misused. That's the trick. Yeah, you know, um, there's a couple of things about Valerie. One that I think is interesting is um, she, well, she may have been told to shut up and go away. In which case you can see why she didn't come back on board. And because this picture is public, <laughs> um, well, remember there's a few things I have. I have pictures of her and I have composites and then some weird stuff. <laughs> uh, and then also the fact that she looked exactly like Catherine Deneuve, I think is interesting. Um, but go ahead. Why don't you give me another question? Cause I have these pictures, but I just want to see if I have the main one. Yeah, go for it. Um, I hadn't heard this, but Cappy go lucky says, Umuamua is coming back. <laughs> no, Have you heard that? No, is it? I don't know. That's I mean, pretty is, good. And if it is, is that its natural path or does well, that show? That, that would mean Avi Loeb over here at Harvard would be <laughs> ecstatic. You know, I'll never forget him and Lou putting up the telescope. Heroes to humanity. I can't believe. Uh, well, we all know about the day when Lou showed up at my cafe. That was rather interesting. I, I kind of think you're right about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that's great. Well, that's not Valerie, but that's a good shot of Casey there. Uh, we actually have, we have someone in the audience who is uh, watching from the ARE tonight. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah I love the great. ARE. It's one the of library the greatest, is amazing. greatest places. And uh, the people there are great, um, you know. I just think they've had a hard time. I also think that um, 
the people who are at the top at the ARE are a little afraid of Casey's Atlantis information because it's so hardcore. And I don't think they've ever been able to cope with it or get, you know, like, how do you get your members on board with a case? It's like, well, they made androids, you know, basically they did this animal human thing and they called them, you know, they were basically things and they were automatons and, you know, they brought them by the thrones into Egypt. And, uh, you know, that's very, very heavy. Imagine Casey doing this in 1920, in 1930. Like, you know, even now, I think <laughs> there's terrible difficulty in it. A couple of interesting pictures. Okay, first, let's start with this. Remember, I was talking about women around the UFO thing. How about this? Now, y'all may be very familiar with a book called Aztec. A UFO crash at Aztec and um, Frank Scully, of course, who they named the famous character in the X Files after. Well, there he is after his book comes out in discussions with Eleanor Roosevelt. Yeah, <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt knows all about the X apparently, and she's spending some good time with Frank Scully, who's writing about the biggest UFO book in 1950. Um, I thought that was interesting. And uh, my other interesting shot like that is the bosom buddy shot of Eisenhower <laughs> with Kenneth Arnold. It's like, hey, he's my UFO uh, pal. Not to mention Harry Truman with Frank Edwards, who's writing Men in Black books. I mean, you know, these people, they know their sources. They're, they're not, there's no, if you know how to look at them. <laughs> um, and... That, that's Catherine Deneuve, and she apparently, um, apparently, uh, wow. Valerie is like her clone, basically. Her doppelganger. <laughs> so, quite interesting um, on that. I have more pictures, but what else you got, Miss Olivia? Um, 5DRG says, so sad to think of the world we could be in if that joint moon mission had taken place. And uh, Thomas Paul yeah. says, yeah, instead of Camelot, we got freaking Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> right. Instead of Camelot, you got freak a lot. And it's <laughs> led by Chris Mellon. Um, yeah, it's pretty fascinating. Okay, a couple of things here. Time waves. Psychic Technology Group. That's the 70s. Um, group that Valerie developed with Gordon Cooper and they called it advanced technology group for the public. And then the inside people knew it. It's PTG. Um, this, and I'm showing it cause it's public. And this is um, a shot of Valerie from last year working with a medical charity and she's, she's still out there. There she is circled. And in her 70s now, she knows a great many things, and she would be a remarkable guest uh, on this program. Let's see. Let's see if Valerie will talk to me. <laughs> Do you think that she, it sounds to me like she was an Earth ambassador? Yeah. You know, we always yeah. talk about this. Yeah. Um, do you is there? Do you have any idea, uh, even if we could find out, and how we could find out how many Earth ambassadors there would be? Would they all be psychic? Would they need to be if, especially if aliens are interdimensional, uh, that you couldn't, that would be the best way to communicate with them? Well, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to put this in some funny terms and, uh, we know we have Gigi's out there. She'll get a kick out of this, but imagine you're Andre Paharic mm -hmm. and you're with the CIA and their goal is to, to develop an interface with this other um, dimension. And at the same time, let's suppose they're trying to develop an interface of contact with beings they've recovered in UFO crashes. And uh, so what they want to do and what he's doing with space kids, recruiting, trying to find the right telepath for this. And they're trying to also organize UFO crash retrievals and realize there's a component that's missing with everything that they do. Somebody gets the bright idea. They're missing a psychic component to it all. Um, one of the stories that John Warner told in our two episodes ago is how he had found out about an FDR 
program, which is like the early remote viewing program through FDR. And of course, we've had Russell Targ on this show to talk about the remarkable remarkable things. His book just has come out and uh, we'll have him come back. So Russell, if you're out there, we're, we're talking to you soon. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, you have these types. So what they want to do is they want to find like a G.G. Young. And if those guys can get their hands on a G.G. Young, let's say in this case, like a Valerie they got, and they were able to kind of develop this interface between Valerie and whatever this other thing was. Now, this other thing could have been masquerading as an alien, <laughs> um, or it could have been the real deal. And again, you get all different stripes. Remember how we started the program out that J. Allen Hynek said in private, you know, I think the answer to the UFO enigma is in the Theosophy book of Rudolf Steiner. And extensively in that book, he talks about elementals. Um, so they're searching for the psychic ability to interface with the technology and contact this thing. So you have that, that you have that one process. Then you have the actual gifted person and their ability to interface with, you know, higher consciousness. Look at Edgar Casey. You know, he sees himself as a dot outside of his body. He goes through these different realms. On either side, in the beginning, he sees kind of dark, shadowy figures with one part of the body magnified. Then things lighten up and he sees trees and homes and things start to glow in the distance. And suddenly, very fast, he arrives at this kind of hall of records and someone there hands him the book of the individual that he's doing the reading for. So there are people who have a developed sense of being able to operate in this world and then also to keep their consciousness in those other realms. That's the factor. Whether it's dealing with aliens, whether it's dealing with other consciousnesses, elementals or whatever, that's the factor that they're after. That's what Space Kids was all about. That's how they developed Valerie probably originally and they used her, you know, she had this incredible ability. But that program, if anything, is probably on overdrive. And um, like I said, if they could have run across <laughs> someone like a Gigi when she was young, that that's would have been what they were looking for, somebody who could interface with both. So for me, they have a targeted program on psychics. And the space program doesn't make any sense to me unless you include which is why a technical readout of many of these subjects on its own doesn't make sense. You need, why do you think there's a, a Crowley aspect involved with NASA? Why do you think Parsons and all that is involved? And Parsons is incredibly influential. This is not like somebody who was just one of the lightweight scientists around it. He's the guy who built our rocket program. Um, why is there so much occultism involved in the Nazi space movement? Why did Winston Churchill, to the whole Nuremberg thing, say, don't mention any, and I mean any, of the occult stuff about the Nazis at all? There's a reason, and it's because there's an interface there between what they're working with technologically and the consciousness interface with this other thing. And uh, I think that's where we arrive in with the Valerie story. Were you just talking about, like, Nazi psychic breeding? Or did I? Yes. Okay. Or, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is another show for sure. But yeah, <laughs> they were trying to um, create through those the programs that they had large scale programs for, you know, developing kids for the state anyway, but they had a program for developing psychic children. We have that program, um, in my opinion, that's part of, of uh, what, programs like what Paharich were, were doing, was doing, turned into. And um, I'll tell you what's interesting about Paharich, and one thing I didn't get into, which is Paharich, wherever he goes, large sightings follow. Now, what's interesting also is Valerie, where she goes, large sightings follow. And so the thing that I picked up on was this town of Ossining, where she went to study with Paharich. It's a little nice town in Westchester County in New York. And uh, Peter Falk is from Austin, was from Austin. So here's a story about a UFO case in Austin. 
Gloria Scalzo, a bookkeeper, was driving north on the Taconic Parkway toward her home in Ossining at 8.55 when she spotted lights. She watched for some time before losing sight of them. She couldn't get it out of her mind. A few minutes after leaving the parkway, she suddenly said she made a U-turn to go back to have another look. I had to, she told us. Back to Taconic. She spotted the lights again, just south of the Underhill Exchange. They were coming from the northeast right at me. And they appeared larger as they came nearer, and I thought, my God, this thing is big. Remember we started with the football field reference from John Warner, who said the craft that Paul Mellon was on in the underground Nazi bunker was as big as a football field or a football field and a half uh, in diameter. At this point, it appeared just like a huge wing. I slowed and was aware that other people were looking at it. I was thrilled and wondered what it was. It was still some distance away. Then all of a sudden, just like that, it was over my car. It just appeared. I don't understand this part. It was as if it just jumped from one place to another. The lights on the object now went out one at a time as if someone turned them off, then reached for another and another until they were all off. This was the only time that I felt any fear. I looked up and there was nothing, not even a sound. The lights were out only for a moment, then they came back on. It was at this point that I was going to drive away, but instead I rolled down the window and watched this large UFO as it drifted away. The UFO continued to move east and passed over Briarcliff Manor, just north of Ossining. Um, So then there are all these other witnesses, and some of them say, yeah, it was a boomerang shape or whatever. This wave in Westchester County turns into the Hudson Valley wave, where all those people get swept up in it. Whitley Strieber, Dan Aykroyd, all those reports. And to me, it's interesting that Valerie's working with Baharaj in Austin. You know, it's just like, are these things following them around? Are they part of the interface of these things? Or is that the program that Baharaj is attached to involves advanced craft and testing the public's ability to comprehend the craft? These are the questions that come out of it. And of course, we could have gone deeper on Paharich tonight, but we had Cooper and we had Valerie, and really Valerie was the core of this thing. But Paharich stands there in the middle of it, and it's quite odd that even when we get to John Fuller, who's covering this kind of mass hallucination, uh, hallucinogenic experience that happens in France, and then the other book that he did was the Betty and Barney Hill <laughs> uh, abduction experience, and he's close friends and associates with Paharich. So Paharich is around everything that's psychedelic or alien. And it's funny because when you get into things like Joe Rogan and things like that now, they're constantly trying to interface aliens and psychedelic experience. That for me, there, somebody is nudging that. I don't think it's a natural fit. Um, something about trying to merge those two topics sounds to me like a an effort, a program. And it's also to normalize the use of psychedelics for like the fun of alien <laughs> experience. That's not, to me, a good combination at all. Uh, yes? Okay. So what were they both doing there in Westchester County at that time? That's, uh, well, she studied with him. And yes, but why did they go there? Well, he went, he was at first he was in Maine. And remember when he was in Maine, all this weird stuff happened. As a matter of fact, I I'm thinking, let me just go <laughs> cut to the chase. Are they op intentionally opening up portals? Are they, are they going to places now, to see if yeah, they can do it? That is very interesting. Well, portals gets you into a Parsons type yes. conversation. This article, uh, which was in psych out <laughs> Rockport history, all about Maine was all about the weird experience of having Paharich do all of his stuff in Maine. And what happens is um, he goes through a scandal where basically he falls in love with his nanny. <laughs> and because of that, the funding for Paharich and maybe the CIA thing, because this is 1956, 57, they yank. And so he can no longer operate up there. It seems to me he moved back to Europe for a while. He got 
into Peter Herkos, who was a major psychic. He did things like found the Boston Strangler, and, and he used to help the FBI solve crimes. Very interesting Dutch psychic. And Is he um, the one that fell from the ladder? He did. Mm -hmm. he, he was not psychic in his ordinary life. He was a house painter, and he fell off of a ladder, but he fell a significant distance. He was a house painter, and uh, when he woke up, he came out of a coma, and he had all these wild uh, experiences and visions, and then he suddenly could read everyone's mind and then see their future and things like that. And Peter Fer Herkos became quite, uh, a phenomena. As a matter of fact, Paharich, <laughs> that's how weird this gets. There was a show, I'm trying to think of the name, it was kind of like a Twilight Zone type show, but it wasn't quite that well known. And um, Paharich produces a segment which is written about Peter Herkos, but so it's like a fictional take on the real Peter Herkos. And this is how weird it's getting. It's like Baharich is putting psychic Peter Herkos out on TV, national TV, in 1962 or something. So it seems to me Baharich goes through these things, withdraws, and he comes back strong with Yuri Geller in the 70s. Remember, Baharich is also the primary conduit of the nine. He's the one who brings the nine together and studies that, and they're getting all these ET messages from a craft that's supposedly connected with our Egyptian ancestors. Could very well be. But nonetheless, it's quite unusual, the nine. And that has the DuPonts involved. That has Forbes involved. You know, it has Arthur Young. And uh, what you find is a lot of people involved with the Young show up as, you know, connected with Ruth Payne and Michael Payne and the JFK assassination. So, you know, there, there are uh, these interfaces and you have to... <laughs> You have to really study that and you say, what brings together advanced technology, psychic activity in extreme wealth? What is the element? What's the connecting Power. element? Yeah, this is what, you know, so it's kind of like if you study Peter Dale Scott's work, he doesn't, he's not doing anything about mysticism, don't get me wrong. But when he brings together the deep state connections, what does he do? He says, well, you know, what do organized crime, intelligence, big oil, big finance, uh, the intelligence agencies and their contractors like Booz Allen Hamilton. What is that? What do they all have in common? Remember the deep state, the term came about because in Turkey, there was a car crash that was widely reported in the media and it had the, you know, uh, one of the prime minister's family. It had one of the biggest drug dealers from a, a group called the wolves in Turkey and it had the police commissioner, you know, and it had a beauty queen and the person who was musing writing this article about it said, there's some kind of a deep state that connects them all. And professor Scott was like, Oh my God, my deep politics, this is the same thing. And this is how we get to understand it is when these things interface together. So when we're looking at the congressional hearing piece, by the way, what are you saying when you see congressional people waving flags for UFO defense offices, and then you have UFO whistleblowers sent forward by the CIA to say, oh, I found crash craft or whatever. What connects this process? Who's behind that process? Um, that's where you have to go if you want to get to the answers on that. We'll take one more question and we're out for tonight. Miss Olivia, you're up. Okay. So Bo Krill says, I've recently read that the movie Exorcist was actually a boy. Now I've also found out that boy went on to work at NASA JPL, mm -hmm. like Jack Parsons. Um, has DJ heard this? Yes. And um, I know a lot about that story. <laughs> Maybe I can enlighten you as time goes along about the Exorcist. This should be interesting. But um, yeah, it is very, very interesting. And thank you for bringing those can, points up. Can I up. throw something out before we finish up? Yes. Um, I was just thinking, so Kit Green served Valerie in a medical capacity, mm -hmm. right? Her medical handler is the Her way that handler. Valet described when it. When you were talking, when we we're talking about breeding, I immediately oh, went there. Isn't that interesting? Well, listen, this is fascinating because 
remember if if he's talking about and understands what the breakaway is maybe he understands that the breakaway is kind of using people like valerie that makes sense to me and um if anything he he may indeed uh be somebody who interfaces is aware of x protect and is aware of the breakaway you mentioned austining and i just wanted to give you this straight out of um cooper's book and then we'll wrap it up tonight but wow incredible questions miss olivia and the ideas from just phenomenal and i know this is a lot to take in there's more to come uh so valerie did all this stuff she did all the spoon bending stuff for cooper she could do it better than yuri geller valerie described working with the space kids remember when she was seven years old she was working with Paharich. Uh, they spent, uh, Valerie described the space kids as long time tuned in. They spent time in austening, perfecting their telepathic skills. Austening again, this is it. Um, telepathic powers, Valerie went on, are part of human evolution. The potential lies in every human being. You just need to eliminate the distraction. They also practice remote viewing. The power which the subconscious mind uses to travel to different times and places to see actual events. The U.S. military um, and CIA has secretly become involved in remote viewing research. And unbeknownst to Valerie at the time was funneling money into Paharich's private research group in the furtherance of what became known as psychic espionage. This is crucial. Psychic espionage, UFO espionage, two of the pieces that are not included in any of this current wave of BS disclosure, but crucial to the main picture. The CIA's program known as Stargate would not become public until 15 years later. Who's associated with Stargate? Chris Mellon. Um, known as Stargate wouldn't come out until 15 years later. And when former government remote viewers began to come forth with their stories in articles and books, Pahart conducted experiments in a Faraday caged named after Michael Faraday, who in 1931 rocked the scientific world with his discovery that magnetism could produce electricity if it was accompanied by motion. The cage was a rectangular metal box, approximately eight by eight, 12 feet, which was lined with copper and placed in insulated supports. Inside was a complete electrical vacuum. No electromagnetic waves such as TV and radio signals could penetrate the cage. This was the environment for various communications experiments to see if the subject was picking up signal from other sources of intelligence. Valerie said, with the shielding, communications came through much clearer when we were in the cage. This was important, she explained, because it served as a double-blind experiment to isolate sing signals, making certain the subject was not reading information from the biofield or local environment. Psychics can read off somebody else's field. We didn't want that, she said. We weeded them out. Valerie explained that space civilizations of beings more advanced than we on Earth had made contact through telepathic means with members of the research group. During her time in Ossining, she said she documented 12 civilizations that appeared to have receivers or agents of change operating on earth, a sort of relay network. These receivers were particularly clear, she said, among the youth, the younger space kids who had sought out Dr. Paharich to have their extraordinary and at times disturbing natural gifts validated. Valerie said it was a priority of hers to document the messages that came through the space kids. And she was one. Now, the problem is, we don't trust Paharich. And so, you know, what he was doing there was using this process again to recruit psychics into that, the black program dealing with the UFO psychic interface. That's the, the kind of rub there. And that's why she may have been, you know, somebody who had been in the program and they were just using her for it. That's my guess. Yes. The Bikini Truther says 12, like the 12 tribes. Oh, 12 is yes. a sacred number. Oh, 12 disciples, mm -hmm. uh, 12 astrological signs. 12 is crucial. Well, 12 is three. It's the law of three. Um, 
Yeah, isn't that interesting? And with that, Miss Olivia, the last question of the I, evening. Didn't we already ask the last question? Oh, good. Okay. Actually, <laughs> if we're no, done, that's good. Okay. Actually, I do want to give alchemical weddings a moment here. Um, control of the astral zone is level eight of the nine point plan of world control after the mental, but before the spiritual. 100 years ago, they were only at level four, according to those who wrote the plan. They being the Russian Rosicrucians, whose plan was stolen by the OGPU slash Stalin. Mm. 2025 is a date they're working towards for occult reasons. It's every 100 years. Alice Bailey said that we're currently in the age of forerunner to this. Isn't that interesting? Um, well, I had, you know, <laughs> although it wasn't related to Lyra or Lyra, the um, the star system stuff got me going. And I started to think about Casey and, you know, he had that prediction about Japan and he said the greater portion of Japan must go into the sea. But he was looking out ahead, earth changes. He saw a number of things. And then we saw this massive earthquake in Japan, 7.6. And some of the videos for that, truly terrifying. Then a 4.1 in Los Angeles. So whatever that grid is on, it's connected. Well, Casey had also said that Los Angeles would be destroyed by an earthquake at some point, which would be terrible, you know. And um, But nonetheless, I was starting to think about Arcturus because I remember him saying Arcturus and Pluto had a gigantic impact on the 21st century. Pluto... Um, Basically, what he said is that people would understand life after death because of Pluto, which is interesting. But here's what he has to say about Arcturus, and somehow, hopefully, it relates to what we're talking about tonight. Uh, by the way, everyone, you're watching The Dark Journalist Show. This is X-Series 163, the Valerie UFO file. There's a lot more with Valerie, and maybe she'll come out of the woodwork to talk to us. I hope so. Uh, Gordon Cooper, NASA, remote viewing the X technology, you name it. We're deep, deep into it tonight. Um, Casey says, Arcturus. Arcturus is of the developing. At one point he calls it the door out of the system. Changing, as it were, from one development to another until the entity passes from that solar system or sphere through Arcturus. Uh, someone asked him, well, the, the problem that we have concerns interplanetary and intersystem dwelling between earthly lives. It was given through this source that the entity, Edgar Casey, after his life as Yolt, which was one of the Casey lives, like Rata, went to the system of Arcturus and then returned to Earth. Does this indicate a usual step or an unusual step in earthly development? As indicated or has been indicated in other sources besides this, as respecting this very problem, Arcturus is that which may be called the center of this universe through which individuals pass and at which periods there comes in choice of the individuals as to whether to return to complete there. That is, in this planetary system, our sun, the Earth, Sun, and its planetary systems, or to pass on to others. This then was an unusual step and yet a usual one. Somehow Arcturus is the key to the development in this system and passing through to other systems. But they make a good point, which is, he says, well, you know, after Casey was Yolt, he went and lived on Arcturus. <laughs> <laughs> so they're like, wait a minute, you know, like what's going on there? So Arcturus is a realm. And so the idea that he was living there, I think basically meant that he was living in the Arcturus realm, you know? And it's interesting because when you track Casey through the different planets, he talks all about, you know, in a Venus body, you do this. In a Mercury body, you do this. In a moon body, you do this. So you you move through and have that relationship to the planets and then come back to Earth, taking all those lessons with you. That's fascinating and I think is very, very um, little studied and little understood. So I guarantee you, just like you know, we're talking about with Pluto, Arcturus, something with Arcturus and Pluto, 
for this year that comes into play. So the more we know about Arcturus, the better. And with that, Miss Olivia, I just want to say that um, the story, the Valerie story piece, there's more to it, and we'll spread it out into another episode. And maybe she will come out of uh, self-imposed retirement for this. But Gordon Cooper putting it all on the record and putting it all out there on the UFO file, even though he was this famous astronaut and could have, when the book came out in 2000, really, you know, looked like a raving lunatic. <laughs> But here he was putting it on the line just as he did when he wrote his letter to the UN saying in 1978, we have to deal with this issue of the UFO file. Um, this is a guy who's with unique bravery, I guess. And that's why he's in that space program. He's been outside of earth and he had the great knowledge and also the great connection with president Kennedy. And, um, as I said at the beginning of the program, was supposed to be in the Dallas motorcade. So, in fact, as I've mentioned before, Kennedy is going to the trademark to meet Lloyd Berkner, who headed up the Robertson UFO panel. And um, what's interesting is he may have been going to the trademark to make the speech relating to space with Cooper. But Cooper got called away to NASA. So, you know, <laughs> the Dallas trip and the trademark takes on a very interesting uh, shape. And uh, I will say that um, the, the story about um, Poharich in Maine is interesting. And I, I have that whole article here that I dissected some pieces of it. I will bring that out in a future episode. And um, so for everyone, what I would say is that 2024 is the year to go deeper and get these kind of answers. And a lot of material is there. Um, of course, the work that we're doing with you and the ideas from the X series, the work of Gigi Young, a remarkable uh, work that she's bringing through. She just did a, an incredible uh, three hour show. Um, Dr. Farrell's latest book, and uh, our recent interview, John Warner's interview, where uh, he went on the record with his grandfather standing on this, you know, <laughs> saucer as big as a football field and a half in an underground hangar after the war. These are big disclosures. These are big pieces to work with. We have the election and, um, you know, all the things going forward with this year. We need, if anything, the most potent, the less fluff, the less noise. And let's go right down the middle and get it. And that's what we're going to do here uh, with you for the whole year. So thank you so much for being with us here again. Um, just a reminder, if you're new here, especially go to darkjournalist.com, sign up for our newsletter. That's what gets us connected directly. It's a free newsletter, but it keeps us in touch and gets around the censorship that we're seeing so much of. I expect them to ramp up in this election year, which so much at stake. And uh, we hope to be covering that for you as well as the secrecy around uh, the UFO classified hearing us next week. And um, I will let you know if I hear anything more from our uh, whistleblower, Dave Grush, who, um, you know, hopefully will shake off the company of the Chris Mellons of the world and get to real, get to doing real stuff. And uh, with that, Miss Olivia, okay. your super chat. I gather Grush is going to be on 60 minutes for the full hour. Have you heard that? No, no. Yeah, someone in the chat. Yeah, I don't know if that's a rumor or real. Maybe if they have a link, they can email it to admin at darkjournalist.com. I'd appreciate it. And um, if anyone has information about Valerie beyond what I've put out tonight, also admin at darkjournalist.com. That would be fantastic. Yes. Okay. You're All right. Up. Super chats. The Bikini Truther, Your With Me is Fun, Jessica Rodriguez, Red Cap Goblin, Breakthrough Mindset, uh, Global Atlantis, Jonathan McIntosh, Christopher Lombardo, Amarillo Gunrunners, KKMR, Debbie McAdoo, Channeling the Heart, Barbara Joyce, Pretty Pretty Good, uh, Jennifer Walters, Sue, Enough is Enough, Durbin Downey, the Philip K. Dick Film Festival, Sarah Jane. Thank you so much for your generous super chats. Thank you very much. That's the original ESP card set from J.B. Ryan. <laughs> um, we really appreciate your support. Without you, we couldn't do it. And um, to all our subscribers and supporters, um, you know, you make the difference for everything that we're doing. And we look forward uh, to your support of bringing you 
these amazing shows and remember to support the good work uh, that is out there, as we've pointed out, and the people that we're, we're working with here in the X-Series. And we will see you all next week. Exciting things coming up. Uh, and of course, save the date, February 25th, a very important uh, broadcast that we're going to be doing um, and make sure, you know, that that's some good advance warning for you as well. I'm going to do some shout outs before we take off here and see if I can remember how to operate that technology. Black Zionist, Al Qaeda, <laughs> Shane Walker. Yeah, Gigi's, Gigi's out there. Gigi is going to be back on the show. We, we've both been uh, juggling a lot, but she's, she's coming back shortly, as is Dr. Farrell. Dr. Farrell, uh, Joseph's on notice now. He's coming mm -hmm. on soon. Roosevelt, it's great to see you, sir. Another great show, indeed. Miss Olivia, bravo. Thank you. Nicely done, my goodness. And Happy New Year. Rosterman the Seer, Salt of the Earth, Eurythmia's Fun. Woo, Eurythmy, thank you. Terrific, terrific supporter of the show. Caritas Tarot. Congrats on the stellar research, DJ, and great comments, Olivia. Indeed, the ideas from was unusually um, perceptive tonight, really just great. Thank you, Najat. Good night to you as well. Global Atlantis is out there. <laughs> Incredible star for 2024. Well, it's great to have you with us as well at Global. Thank you. It makes our start of the new year even better. Uh, Yes. Good night, Olivia. Ida Pangella. That <laughs> was this. good. Kevin yes. Go Lucky says, we aren't even a week in and it feels like six months. I <laughs> so agree. Isn't that right on? Thanks, DJ and Batgirl. There you go. You got it. <laughs> S23. Uh, Red Cap Goblin. Alchemical Weddings. Yeah. Al Alchemical Weddings. It's great. Great question there tonight. Great comment. Short Order Cook. Good night, lovely people. <laughs> it's great to have you out there. Scarlet Fire, Deb Morehouse, Salt to the Earth, Jessica Rodriguez. Can't wait for the next show. It's great to have you with us, Jessica. I know Kate's out there. It's great to see you, Kate. Corky Goss. Uh, <laughs> I think Joseph's still out there. It's great to have Joseph out there. Bo Krills. He's a lifer, man. I like <laughs> it. That's more like it. X lifer. Thanks everyone. Have a safe and great week. Max Lytle. Wow. Terrific. Great people out there tonight in the ideas room for dark journalist X series 163. Boy, do we have a good time. I like John Warner. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll leave that one there. Bo Krills, Liberty Power, Corey Carter, Tina Borich. Thank you. Dr. Farrell and Gigi <laughs> Young. <laughs> I, I share your sentiments. Question authority. There you go. Yes, especially now. My goodness. Unbelievable. Kat Goida, Hugo, <laughs> Richard Condon, Debbie McAdoo. Wow. Okay. What are we going to close on comment wise? Let's see here. No snow. Oh, good luck. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Forget it. Uh, no, we can't avoid it. It just has to be dealt with. It's like jumping out of the airplane with a parachute. Let's see. I wonder if Chinese New Year will start off with a bang. That's a good one to end on. <laughs> <laughs> like Who said that? That is short order cook. Um, most peculiar. Hey, an upside down UFO image. There we go. Straight up. And of course, let's not forget the people who were hunkering around the mall. Could have been our friends, the tall whites. <laughs> They're known to bust out of the cage. They're like, hey, we don't want to just hang out in Nevada. Get out. We're heading to Miami, baby. We will see you all next week. And uh, if they hang out in casinos, a mall <laughs> is possible. Never let it be forgot once there was a Camelot. And we will see you all next week. Uh, have a fantastic weekend and survive the storm, which is going to wallop us here on the East Coast. And uh, you're going to catch all the people at Harvard hunkering down behind their dormitories. <laughs> but um, we will see you all next week. And it says end broadcast after all, but you know, Never really ends. Never really ends. We'll see y'all next week, everyone. God Have bless. a great night. <laughs> I'm going shopping in Miami, so and so. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs>